This is Paint Life TV. I am Chris the Idaho Painter, and today's video is all about cabinet painting. This video is going to be all about the estimating process, the prepping process, the painting process, and everything in between. If you want any information how to paint your kitchen cabinets or any type of cabinetry, this is the video for you. It is a long video, but we're going to teach you everything you need to know about getting a professional finish on cabinets. So stay tuned for this video. It is quite a long video so grab yourself i don't know something to eat or drink get on the couch get in your bed and start watching this so you can produce a professional finish on your cabinets if you haven't subscribed to our channel on paint live tv hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell right next to it they go kind of hand in hand don't know why youtube has separated the two but if you don't hit one or the other they don't really mean anything and all it does is allows youtube to email you every time i come out with a new video it's free and easy to do now it's going to be free and easy to do for the next next 10 years it's never going to cost you anything we're never going to market to you it's a simple way to help support us and our channel and help us keep making these videos so enough chat enough um i don't know nonsense let's get on to how to get a professional finish finish or finish on cabinets All right, now let's talk about how I estimate cabinets. In the estimating process, I've taught on how to estimate, I'm um, doing exterior estimates online using Google Earth, taught about how to do interior estimates and um, estimating fences and stuff like that and estimating comp cabinets. I'm working on a cabinet job right here and this is a vanity makeover video. If you wanna see this video coming up, how I turn a $25 cabinet into a $500 cabinet, stay tuned for that video. But how do you go about estimating a job like this or how do you go about estimating a full kitchen if you don't have any experience and I estimated cabinets one way for quite a bit of my career and I came up with a different method that was very simple and easy to do and and when I do estimating I like my estimate estimating process really to be very simple I like to be able to do it over the phone if I have to not even show up at the job site so how do you do that you got to have like systems processes numbers that all make sense where you can just ask a customer a bunch of questions come up with a number and give them an estimate and like my exterior bids a lot of times they don't even drive out to the house they just look at it on Google Earth and I want my um, system or estimating process to be very simple and easy and how I come up with an estimate for a cabinet job is I start off with a um, door or drawer price and there's a, a fixed price that I just count the doors or drawers and then that will give me a number and that's a base price. Now, when I do estimating, whether it's an exterior, whether it's an interior, I do have these fixed prices. Like on an exterior, I have a fixed price of $1.65 a square foot and that is my base price. And everything is built off of that using numbers and also the human element. There are times you're gonna have to go out to a job. There's times when I have to go out to a cabinet job and look at the job and use um, human judgment and see if my numbers are coming out right or um, is the job going to be a lot more difficult or a lot easier where I can make some adjustments to those numbers. But I have a cabinet right here. I'll walk you in and show you a full kitchen set of cabinets and how I went about estimating the full set of kitchen cabinets. But it's it's a door and drawer price. So there's a there's drawers right here. You got one, two, three, three drawers. You got a drawer right here, a fourth drawer, and then you've got a door. And my base price per drawer is $95 per drawer, and then it's $115 for door. So here's a door, and here's a drawer front right here. So $95 per drawer, $115 per door. And that's the base price that everything is built off from there. But now there's gonna be some things you're gonna run into with cabinet paint jobs. Um, you have oak grain. That's gonna make the job a lot more difficult than a set of kitchen cabinets that's already painted and you're just repainting it versus starting with a really grainy bare, uh, grainy wood like oak. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the additional charges that are built into that base price, or not built into, it's added onto that base price of $115.95. All right, so I'm gonna talk about one of the things you're gonna run into in the cabinet repaints that is a whole lot more work that you're definitely gonna to wanna to add on an additional charge to your cabinet 
drawer or door price. So right here, this is one and it's oak wood grain. And anytime you have a real grainy wood, it's gonna take a lot of work to get rid of that grain. Now let me talk about customer expectations a little bit because um, when you're doing a cabinet painting job, this is where whether you're talking to the customer on the phone or whether you're talking to them in person, a lot of times cabinet jobs are a lot better dealt with and estimating done in person where you can look at the cabinets and talk about your process, how you go about painting. But what is the customer's expectations? Are the customer's expectations that this look like a flat finish and not a wood grained and in the end result really? Because this thing right here was designed to be stained and lacquered and not to have a flat finish and look like a birch cabinet door. But if a customer wanted this thing to look like a birch cabinet door and not have any wood grain to it, it's gonna take a lot of work to eliminate the wood grain just like this. We're using aqua coat on uh, this cabinet door because we're trying to eliminate probably 90% of the wood grain effect to it and the um, like the pinholes and dark shadows created when you paint something like this white using aqua coat. We got three coats of aqua coat sanding in between aqua coat. That takes a lot of time and effort to deal with that. If you try to paint oak white without filling any grain at all, uh, probably 90% of your customers are not gonna like the outcome of the cabinet. But you do have to discuss um, in the very beginning, you know, expectations and then you know, budget. I mean, what happens is the additional charges just make the price go up higher. Maybe the customer doesn't have a budget that is as high to um, fill wood grain, but um, they really want their uh, cabinets painted and they're not as picky as eliminating all the wood grain. So I have a price per door or drawer and it's $20 per door or drawer. And the face frames are always included and I'll get to that down the road. When I'm talking door and drawer price, the face frame is included in that price. So you got to eliminate wood grain here and you got to eliminate wood grain there. It's $20 per door or drawer and that includes the wood face frames. So I do have side panels on here, and this is just a laminate side panel that has just an imitation wood effect on it. I don't have to laminate any grain on there. We'll talk about side panels a little bit because um, that's an additional charge too in a kitchen. When I walk you into and show you this kitchen, there's a large side panel and where a refrigerator is. And what I actually do is I break that side panel up into uh, door fronts. And so I look at a side panel in an average size door front. I'm gonna say it's about this big. I'm gonna say how many doors would fit in that panel. And I'm gonna call that, like the one panel we'll see, it's about four door panels. We'll cover that whole um, side refrigerator panel. So I'm gonna call it four um, door fronts. And that's how I deal with really large panels. And um, the face frames are always included. Large panels um, are broken down into door fronts. And we'll give you an example when we walk, walk into this kitchen. The next item that I have as an additional charge to my door and drawer front is we see quite often is naughty alder cabinets. And naughty alder is gonna be an alder that has a lot of open knots in it. And it was a stained and lacquered design with a knot design that looks really cool. But what happens is when you start to paint it and what's popular now is painting them white, you're gonna see really dark shadows all over the place. And first, the first time I ever painted a set of cabinets like that, I thought, wow, it's gonna look really cool with these knots. I painted them. It didn't look really cool with the knots at all. It looked really unfinished. The knots stood out really bad because they were basically a black shadow in the white cabinets. And so we went back and refilled it. And refilling knots is another time consuming process. It's not as time consuming as, gr as grain filler because you're filling the grain on the entire cabinet, but you're just finding the knots and we fill them with spackle first. Uh, so one coat of spackle, then we go over it with two coats of Bondo, and sand that, and then the knot will be completely eliminated. And you do have to go over it with what we call Bondo glazing putty, not Bondo, it's Bondo glazing putty, and it's an automotive product. And if you use that product two coats and sand it properly, you won't ever see where that knot was. What you don't want to do is not get it coat enough um, and with enough Bondo or spackle where you actually see an indentation where that knot is because that won't look good either. But I charge $10 per door or drawer on a naughty alder set of kitchen cabinets as an additional charge. So on top, if, the, if I was charging the doors, that's $115 per door. If it's naughty alder, I'm gonna add $10 to that. So it's gonna be 125 
five dollars per door uh, if they're naughty all or we got a drawer front it'd be ninety five dollars per drawer front add ten dollars to that it's going to be a hundred and five dollars to eliminate any knots uh, if it's a naughty alder cabinet. Now, if you had a drawer and it didn't have any knots in it, but other ones did, then I wouldn't charge that additional charge for that door or drawer. So while we're on the subject of filling holes, I'll talk another about another scenario we've run into um, several times where the customer wants to eliminate the um, doorknob holes. This doesn't have any doorknobs, they're just open by grabbing the doors, the door itself, the top or the drawer front, the bottom of it. If the customer is eliminating door knobs or poles and or is changing location, you're going to have to fill those holes. And if you use just spackle and spackle it, sand it, you will be able to see where that, um, that hole was. What you need to do, once again, like a naughty alder, you need to spackle it. And I use um, Crawford's. I don't use like um, a lightweight spackle. I use Crawford's interior exterior spackle, which is more of a heavy duty spackle and doesn't shrink as much. I'm gonna fill the holes. Then I'm gonna put two coats of Bondo glazing putty on top of that, sand it, check it in an inspection light and be very, very critical because what you don't wanna do is paint the door and see an indentation where that pole hole was. So it does take spackle, two coats of Bondo to eliminate it. It is time consuming and I have a price for that. And the price to do a whole set of kitchen cabinets is a flat fee of $250. So let me talk about another fee that I have an additional charge and that is multicolors. This is something that you don't run into very often, but I have run into it where they want the bottom set of kitchen cabinets white and they want the top set of kitchen cabinets gray or they want the kitchen cabinets white and an island gray. And it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but it's loading and reloading colors and cleaning up and changing colors and ordering two gallons instead of one gallon. So you have a little bit left of you know, two gallons instead of just one gallon. So the paint, there's gonna be additional cost in paint. You have to take that into consideration. And I have an additional charge for multicolored kitchen cabinets, and that's $200 if you want more than one color in your kitchen or wherever you're actually painting the cabinets. I mean, when I, I keep referring to kitchens, but it could be, it could be a vanity, it could be a laundry room, um, there's, it could be an entertainment center or a lot of different case scenarios, but where it's, most of this is really geared towards kitchen cabinets because that's the bulk of what we paint when it comes to cabinets. So here's another scenario you're gonna run into, and this is a door, this is a recessed panel door right here, and it's got a, a gap, and it has a floating panel right here, and there's uh, a couple different schools of thoughts. Should you caulk them, should you not caulk them? I won't get into that. If you wanna know my opinion about caulking floating panel doors, you can go check out my video that's part of this series of caulking floating panel doors and what's my opinion and can you have success doing it? But I do have a price for doing um, or caulking panel doors. Now, it's pretty rare that I would ever caulk a recessed panel door or floating panel door anymore. There is some liability issues with it, so you gotta determine your climate, where you're at. Um, does that panel truly float or is it locked in there and sealed? Uh, do you live in a moist climate, a dry climate? Take all that stuff into consideration before you ever start um, painting floating paneled or recessed paneled doors. Because if there's any movement and the type of coating you're putting over the top, I use water-based PUs, which are more flexible than lacquers, so they're less likely to crack around the caulking. But what you don't want to do is caulk this door, paint this door, and have it crack and have to deal with that later on down the road due to expansion and contraction of the wood. But if I'm caulking doors, and um, um, not drawers, that you could have a recessed panel drawer in some um, cases, but if I'm doing any type of caulking you know, on these things, I'm gonna charge my fee is $10 per door or drawer. So I have a method that I use uh, when I'm caulking these things. I use a tile sponge and it's a really tight open cell sponge and I'll put a small bead of caulking around there and the sponge is wet and I'll caulk that thing, get a really tight bead, I'll smooth it out with the sponge and then you'll have a really nice bead on the cabinet doors now. You know, once again, there is a school of thought. Some guys are just, you just adamantly never caulk these doors. I'm not gonna be caulking these doors. I like the look of it without it caulked, but there are situations where 
previously painted cabinets have paint bridging over the gaps and if you're painting them white it could look really ugly so are you going to be caulking them make sure you use the right caulking make sure you right use the right top coat make sure you're in the right climate and then make sure you charge for it because it is additional work. It is time consuming to get it nice, neat, and tight. So once again, I charge $10 per door or drawer. And if there's any type of caulking that would be on the face frames or the side panels that would be included in the door or drawer front price. So another little thing you'll run into occasionally and I do charge more for it and it's gonna be a inserted glass door. And you'll see doors like this instead of a panel, it'll have glass so it can be used to display like china or stuff like that and every now and then you'll run into a kitchen that'll have two of them on one of the boxes to be able to display stuff inside that box and those doors usually have um you know something that run you run into that's an issue whether it's removing the glass or masking the glass and deal with it one time we had to remove the glass on them there was no way to paint around them but we couldn't remove the glass we needed to take it to a glass shop to remove it and have it reinstalled after we are done and so you definitely anytime you're dealing with glass just the simple liability that you could break it is um, something you know you need to add an additional charge to and if I have a door that has glass in it my my um, typical door price for a door is $115 per door. If there's glass in it, I charge $145 per door and that's gonna have that built-in liability. What if I break the glass? What if the glass has to be removed by a glass shop or just the time masking the glass and dealing with the glass paint bleeding onto the glass, getting onto it. So definitely have an additional charge for um, glass inserted doors. There's one more thing that I have additional charge for. Now, occasionally, um, this isn't the greatest example, but inside the boxes, every now and then you're gonna run to a customer that wants the inside painted most of the time the insides of them are white melamine and it's never a great idea to paint melamine if you're painting the side which is some type of um, melamine on the side you definitely want to prime it with something like um, XIM UMA as a great primer the inside of the boxes if they're melamine and they're adamant you paint them you really need to be priming them with something proper like UMA primer but inside the boxes are not easy to spray they're tight space Spaces, hard to get in there you're getting a lot of overspray kicking back at you and it's just not as easy as taking a cabinet door and spraying a cabinet door down or spraying it up very simple it's very controlled inside the boxes getting 100% coverage not getting runs and um, just spraying it is not easy to do and once you've done one set you'll realize why you need to charge additional money for the inside of boxes or cabinets so when it comes to the inside of the boxes, I have another just built in, um, or not built in, an additional price. It's $30 per door or drawer for um, cab doing the inside of the boxes. So if I got a door right here, it's a $30 additional charge. So I got a door and a drawer right here. So it's gonna be $60 and that's gonna cover that area. So if I'm doing this whole inside of this thing, I'm gonna count the doors and drawers right there, add $30 for each. That's what it's gonna take to paint the inside of the box. Now, of course, this thing has been ripped out, pulled out. It's easy to spray the inside of that. So that's where the human element comes into play. Well. $30 might not you know uh, be appropriate for that situation and so when it comes to the bidding process once again there's always this human element that needs to be taken into consideration you could have all these built-in charges um, or these additional charges I could have $115 per door $95 per drawer and the bid comes out to $5,000 but I don't have any work for the next three months and I really got to pay my house payment the human element is going to tell me I I need to lower my price you know possibly to be competitive to get the job or you're booked out for three months and um, you know you've got too much work on your hands you really should be increasing your price because maybe your price is too low you really should know your numbers where you're at where you live 
because one thing you don't want to do is take $150, 15 per door, $95 per door and apply that, say, in California, in L.A. or um, Manhattan in New York because you would be missing the boat by about 50 percent, you know, on what you're charging because there's certain um, you know, geographical locations where the prices are going to be higher and then there's certain places where possibly the prices will be lower. So you really have to understand where you're at and what the going rate for is. And once you figure out the going rate, you can um, adjust, you know, or not adjust from there. If you have no idea what it is, you can just start doing bids and you can, um, if you're not getting the bids at all, maybe you're too high. If you're getting every single bid you're putting out there, then you may be too low. So you just got to really understand, you know, um, the, the numbers you're throwing out there and uh, are they appropriate or not appropriate? Are they, um, you know, uh, within the price range that they should be where you live or where you don't live? All right, so I'm going to go over our doors and drawers right here. We've got, I counted up, we got 17 doors. We've got 19 drawer fronts right here. And if I do the math, 95 and 115, that comes up to $3,800. Now, do I have any situations or scenarios where I'm going to do any additionals and add-ons? We do have a large panel on the opposite side of the refrigerator there. We do have a large panel on the end of the counter right here. We do have some panels, you know, on the end of here, but I don't consider those large panels. I just consider these part of the face frames. These cabinets have been caulked. They've um, all been filled. We do, this is not a functioning drawer. There's, um, they're attached on there, but they do come off and we count these false drawers as um, actual drawers themselves. So those are two drawer fronts right there. Um, door poles are going to be coming off. We're not going to be doing any um, replacing of, of any poles or anything or filling of holes. The cabinets themselves, the human element, I mean, these cabinets are fairly clean and pretty good shape. I mean, are the cabinets just extremely beat up? Are they going to take a lot of sanding, a lot of the work? Are they really contaminated? Here's one question you always want to ask your customers if these are stained and lacquered cabinets, you know, what did they clean their cabinets with? If the customer ever tells you they cleaned, it, cleaned them or use any type of product like lemon oil or Pledge, a lot of people use Pledge. It seems to be something common. Pledge is, is a really bad contaminant that's, um, will cause extreme cases of fish eye and it gets embedded into the lacquer and you can't get it out easily. And if a customer has ever told you that they've used Pledge to clean your cabinets, that's almost a job you may not even want to do. You're going to have extreme cases of fish eye. Uh, we've had success eliminating fish eye using a shellac, 100% shellac primer. Um, and we've also used a product called Smoothie. But if these cabinets were lacquered cabinets, they said they use Pledge to clean them. I'm probably going to charge about $700 to $1,000 just to deal with the fish eye issues with these cabinets. But I have an end panel over here and that end panel to me, I'm going to count that end panel is probably three doors. So that's 115 times three. I got an end panel down here. I'm going to count that one probably is one door right there. And then this end panel right here, we've got kind of a, a fairly big end panel right there. And I'm probably going to count that is one right there. The kitchen cabinets are going to be all one color. This is going to be a pretty fast kitchen cabinet job. We can typically do a job like this with a crew of three to five guys. We can do it in two days. This is probably a crew. I'm going to have three guys in here working on this job. And my goal is to get it done in two days, come back the third day and um, for just a half a day, probably three hours to put everything and assemble it back together. Uh, inside the, the boxes, the inside of these boxes, they're just white melamine. There's not going to be any painting. Our process painting them when it comes to a drawer, we take the drawer um, out. We require the customer to have everything emptied out of the cabinets. There's They can't have anything in the cabinets because of liability issues. So when you bid your cabinets, you want to make sure you tell your customer there can be nothing in the drawers and there can be nothing inside the cabinets because when you got to be able to get inside there and mask. And I'm going to show you how we mask cabinets in my video um, series, Painting Cabinets. That's where we're 
working on right now on um, on the whole series painting the cabinets. But um, can you have had anything in the boxes? Has to be completely empty and clean. The drawer fronts, there's just two screws on the sides or on the backs of them. We're just gonna unscrew, take the front off, set the box aside, and um, that's kind of the, the painting process, what it looks like. So um, any other things I can go over with this set of kitchen cabinets? So this one has crown molding that's attached um, in a stained and lacquered job. You know, you're typically gonna caulk um, the corners and caulk um, underneath there on crown molding. If you're doing a caulking of the floating panel job, you're gonna wanna caulk those things. That's all included in um, the door price. So it's gonna be $10 per door if you're caulking anything. So caulking the crown molding is gonna be included in that. All right, so I've counted up my doors, counted up my drawers. I've added on additional charges for my uh, large panels and I've come up to about $4,260. Not sure if I added on the one for this, the panel right here, but I'm right in that, that $4,300 range and that's about the price we charge for an average set um, of kitchen cabinets. We're somewhere right around $4,300, $4,500 for an average set of kitchen cabinets. Now that's gonna go up, you know, if these were oak or alder, or it could go down once again at the human element. We can do this set of kitchen cabinets in a couple days and these have already been painted. There's not gonna be a lot of uh, prep work. There's not gonna be a lot of sanding and we're gonna get this job done pretty fast. If I don't have any jobs in line, um, and I really need to pay my bills, I might drop it down to like 3,900 and that's where you just gotta think you don't want to really underbid yourself and uh, work for free basically. You wanna get paid for the work you're doing and the craftsmanship you're gonna be giving your customer. So I'm just gonna touch on you know bidding over the phone now versus actually going and bidding you know in person. And what happened kind of like exteriors, I started doing a lot of exteriors. We we're painting five a week, and eventually I couldn't make it out to you know sell myself on every single job. Developed a system and a process by doing exterior bids using Google Earth. And if you don't have any work and you really need the work or you're not booked out very far, it's always gonna be best to go out, meet your client, really try to sell yourself. But as your, as your business builds up and you get more and more referrals, we're starting to get most of our work just by referrals only. And so then I'm going out and, or I'm not actually going out, I'm doing the bids uh, by using Google Earth on exteriors. When it comes to cabinets, I'm doing a lot of cabinet bids now by phone and photograph. And so I'll do, ask the customer, you know, all the questions I need, get all gather all the information I need to know about the cabinets, have them send me multiple pictures. I'll have them count the doors and the drawers, and then I'll give an estimate. And I've done so many cabinets. They say almost, um, you know, the, the, the scenarios, they all are very, pretty much the same, um, but there are some differences. And sometimes you'll make a little bit more, make a little bit less, but on average, it works itself out if you're doing you know, quite a few uh, cabinets, but by phone, you know, I'm just gonna ask you know, some of the questions. What type of you know, wood are there? What, what type of wood are they? What's your expectations you know, with it? How many doors, how many drawers? Would you clean it with? Get all those questions you know, out of the way and um, then I can build my estimate up and email them the estimate, but you want to make sure you're confident with your bidding process. You've done enough cabinets, you know, in person that you know the questions to ask, you know, over the phone, but we're doing so many, you know, cabinet bids now that, you know, I can do them by phone and it becomes convenient. But once again, you know, if I really want the job, I'm going to go out there. There are times, you know, we always tell the customer also, once we send them the estimate, if they would like to talk to us personally, we will come out and talk to us personally if the numbers fall in, you know, their budget and they're possibly interested in us doing the cabinets. So there you have it. There's some tips and tricks doing cabinet estimates. If you guys got any questions or comments, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of you know questions about you know um, the bidding process. Leave it down in the comment section below. If you want me to go over anything else, you know, on video, 
uh, about cabinet bidding, or maybe you want to see a video on interior. Actually, I do got you know other bidding and estimating videos out there. Go check those out. Uh, use the comment section below. We'd love to hear what you have to say. If you've got a different process or um, you got different methods, systems, or processes, leave them down below. If you want to help us out, I always learn by reading the comments, and we try to read and answer all of our questions and comments. All right, so we're gonna get ready to make this vanity over. So I need to take off all the doors and hardware. I've got my table set up. I'm gonna be using AquaCoat. AquaCoat is a great product for eliminating wood grain or grain in really grainy woods like oak. So I'm gonna be applying it with some plastic uh, rubber spatulas, plastic or rubber. I guess it's a hard plastic. This is what I like to use or I even use a credit card, but any type of spatula that's not going to um, scratch or mar the wood. So I'm gonna get all this taken off. We're gonna get it on our inspection table and start applying our first coat of aqua coat. I think it's probably gonna to take to get rid of all this grain, either it's gonna take at least two, maybe three coats. So let's apply our first coat of aqua coat and we'll show you what it looks like applying it. All right, we're gonna start removing our doors and drawers and our hardware so we can begin the painting and aqua coat process. I like to have a tool belt with me where I can access my tools that I need to work with. So I'm putting everything together right here. I'm gonna be needing some tape to do the labeling and a uh, Sharpie marker. So it's just start by removing your doors or drawers and labeling them. So I've got my First one removed, this is upper upper left side and there's a thing that's installed right over the top of that. So I can take and just label this right here. I'm gonna write on this door right here what this is, where it goes. This is upper left. So I'm just gonna be upper left. So it identifies where that goes. All right, so I removed my first door, and it's interesting, these doors have a device on the back of them that keep them from opening all the way up. And I'm gonna show you how I label these things and what this device looks like. So this device is mounted on the back of this drawer, so it keeps it, or uh, drawer front, so it keeps it from opening all the way, and then it's kind of a little storage thing. So this thing mounts on here like that. You're not gonna see anything. We typically mark where the hinge holes are, so the hinge installs over it. I'm gonna write right on the wood, this is upper left, and I don't have to worry about the markings on that wood right there because once again, this hardware mounts right over the top of that. I'm gonna be spraying both sides of this uh, drawer right here, and if I don't cover it with tape, what's gonna happen? I'm just gonna paint right over it, and you won't even see it anymore. So I'm just gonna cover that with tape, and that covers my, um, my description of where it goes. So I'm gonna set that aside, remove the other one right here, and we're gonna do the same thing. Just make sure you label, if you don't label, Everything, and I've done this in the past, didn't label stuff, and it was an absolute nightmare reinstalling it. What happens if you don't label it, what I've noticed is um, the doors won't shut properly because they're installed in different areas, even though every door is identical. So this is upper right. Now you can take, in the past, and um, a long time ago, I would just mask the box off and stand this up and spray it like that. Now I actually spray both sides of the drawer front and I remove the drawer front. It's got screws on the back side, so I'm just gonna remove these screws and remove it from the box. That way I don't have to mask off the box. And I'm gonna mark this an arrow up because that's the upside of the drawer front. And I'm gonna write middle drawer. And 
And we only got one door, so I don't need to label that door. Arrow going up. So lower drawer. Once again, it's okay to write right on the wood because this is mounted on the back side of the drawer and you're not going to see that. I'm going to set my hardware aside. Don't want to lose any of this. I'm going to show you how I store my hardware and keep my hardware so I don't get it lost. I'm going to remove my hinges because I'm going to be painting the cabinet itself. So I'm going to remove hinges. Since this is a small project, we typically label our hinges also where our hinges go. And I'm going to, these are, I'll show you what. So this, this hinge mounts, I can write on the hinge because this is what mounts on the wood. So I can write on the back side of that hinge. So this one, I'm going to go one, two, three, four. So this is number two. This one is number one. I really like labeling everything. That way there's no issues with how things open or close when I'm done with the project. I can't get my drill in here because it's too tight. So I'm just using a screwdriver. the old fashioned way. And I'm going to write on the back side of here where nobody can see hinge number one starts right here. So I'm going to write one, two, nobody will ever see that. So I know where one, two, three, and four goes. Everything removed off my vanity. It's all ready to go. The, um, the guides right here, we just mask those off. I don't want to remove the guides. I'm going to leave them on there and we're going to uh, get ready to start buying some aqua coat. All right, I got to clear some space on my table. I'm going to show you how I go about storing my hardware. I got these frog tape. I'm a big fan of frog tape. I use tons of it. I don't get rid of the containers because I use them to organize and store things in home and in my trailer. So now I'm not gonna lose my screws. And I just keep all the different screws separated. And then frog tape has larger containers for you know, their one inch tape, an inch and a half tape. Let's see, these can, set in there. I don't think I've gotten the lids not going to go on them, but I'll just keep them inside there. And now all my stuff is neat, organized, and it's not going to get lost. There's nothing worse than losing a couple of the little hinge screws that um, I now got to run down to the hardware store and get. All right, so I got, uh, I'm going to be painting all sides of these things. I do have so I'm gonna move my coffee out of the way. I'm trying to keep warm because it's winter time and it's cold. So these little bumpers, you've got to scrape these bumpers off. And when I put the cabinets back on, I always put on new bumpers. And they'll leave some adhesive behind that you gotta scrape off also. Get rid of all these bumpers. Get I always like to be really organized, so I got a couple tables. This is gonna be my sanding inspection table right here. I've got my inspection light. So if you don't, if you don't have an inspection light, you'll eventually see this thing lit up. I got a video how to make an inspection light, and I also got a video 
on frog tape containers, all the different uses you can use for those things. It's amazing what you can use frog tape containers for, arts and crafts and stuff like that, but storing all different kinds of things. And there's a screw that just showed up right there. And that's what you don't want to do is lose these things. So it's going to put that screw into his home right here. There you go. Lock tight. And you can take in, if you got a lot of those containers, put a piece of tape on it and label the container what's in that container. So I'm going to get ready to start applying some aqua coat, some tools. Definitely absolutely love the two edge knife. Use it for different things. When it comes to removing adhesive, you could sand it off or you can scrape it off. I'm going to want to scrape everywhere where these hinge holes are and then I'm going to scrape off the adhesive that was left behind from our bumpers. Just want to make sure that these are all scraped because what I don't want is when I'm applying my aqua coat to be hitting you know bumps and um, things that are ridges and stuff that can um, just make applying the aqua coat a little bit more challenging. You also want to do a quick sand, and you're not sanding. Um, other than, you know, I'm not trying to sand my coating off. The aqua coat can go right over the top of previously painted surfaces. It can go over prime surfaces and it can go over unpainted surfaces. I don't prime first because the aqua coat is white and then you don't see where you can go. This aqua coat can go right over this lacquer coating which makes it really convenient. But you do want to sand because sand um, makes the adhesion better. Now the backs of the drawers, I'm not concerned about doing a grain filler on the back of the drawer because nobody can see it. On a door, when the doors open up, you know, if you're um, really particular about the cabinet, you can do the back side of the doors. So if you're painting your cabinets, like um, aqua coat can go over a previously painted surface, but the paint does need to be cured before you apply it. So I got everything ready to go. I'm going to be doing a light sand. I've got a dustless sanding system from Ekasan. This is what I like, absolutely my favorite sander. This is what I do all my cabinets with. A three by four is gonna make the cabinet painting and sanding process way easier. I've got my dustless system over here. It turns on and off just by touching the paddle. And once I touch it, it kicks on the vacuum, ready to go. I've got uh, different Eka Silk sandpapers I'm going to be using when I'm sanding. Um, I'm a big fan of Eka Silk sanding um, abrasives. They're absolutely amazing, the best I've ever used. So I'm gonna just do a light sand and then we're gonna start applying our aqua coat. All right, we're gonna get on with the sanding process now. I'm just gonna do a light sand. Once again, I don't, I'm not sanding the canvas down. I'm not trying to sand the finish off. All I'm trying to do is get a scuff sand on there to get a good bond with my aqua coat. So I've got my Eka sand. I'm gonna be using, because I got to raise panels on here. Um, got some routed edges, contours. All right, I'm gonna be using a half inch Eka sand sponge right here to do my sanding. And I'm just gonna put it on my sander. And this is gonna make it really easy to do the contours. I'm not gonna have to do any of it by hand. So here we go, we're just gonna do light sand.
So I do have some spots where I've got the um, adhesive on there. Uh, that's a super fine sponge because I'm just doing a really light scuff sand. I'm gonna switch it out to a stiffer sponge, a 10 millimeter sponge, and it's gonna sand off this adhesive a little bit faster. Now I'm just gonna switch back to my half inch sponge right here, and I'm just gonna to switch to a medium, medium Echo Silk sponge. So now I got my doors all done, I'm gonna switch over, I'm gonna do my face frames and side panels on my cabinet itself. Got some caulking, this edge here. Just gonna scrape this off. This Linbite scraper it works a lot faster than just trying to sand it off. So these these side panels right here, these are not actual oak side panels. This is just a um, veneer. It's a piece of wood with basically just a paper imitation um, wood grain on there. So you want to be really careful with this. Got some water damage down here on the bottom. Re fix and repair that. I don't want to sand too much because I'll sand right through the paper, you can see. But we are going to prime that, paint that also. We're gonna be painting this kick plate down here, but we got some nails showing through. That'll tear up our sanding pad. We don't wanna our staples. You got some nails that are sticking up right here. I'm just gonna set these nails down there. My sanding pad, I felt it hit there. Kind of messed, I think it might have messed up my sanding pad. We'll tore it a little bit. All right, I've got all the sanding done on this. I'm gonna start applying aqua coat. I'm also gonna use an inspection light. I've seen some things that are gonna to need to be bondoed uh, before we do any painting also. But we're gonna set up, start doing some aqua coats. I'm gonna show you how I apply it, some of the tools necessary to apply the aqua coat in um, large areas and in also small tight spaces. I got some pretty cool little tools that I use for applying it. So um, let's get busy applying. All right, we're on to applying our aqua coat now. I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks applying the aqua coat. We've got all of our sanding done. I started applying some of the aqua coat uh, to get the stuff dry in it, but I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks applying it. I've got my tools. I pulled out one of my other tools that I really like for applying aqua coat. And this is actually one of those things you apply your um, those glass covers on or your sh covers on your cell phones, iPhones. And these things work absolutely great for applying aqua coat in small areas too. But the process is pretty simple. I've, I like having a bucket of water. I've got a bucket of water here, warm water, so I can continually clean my hands or clean my tools as I need to. The um, aqua coat is a water-based coating so it cleans up really easy and your tools clean really easy but you don't want it drying on your tools uh, or it won't go on smoothly. So 
I'm going to start applying it. And when I'm working on a little door like this, I'm just gonna use a small tool. So I'll say, I'm just gonna scoop a little bit of the aqua coat up and I'm gonna start applying it on my door. And I like to go crossways on my very first coat. So I'm gonna crossways to get it down in that grain. I'm gonna work it in just like this. And then I'm just gonna scrape it off. I like to scrape it off going with the grain on my first coat. Now I'm not gonna leave very much behind. The more you leave behind, the more sanding you got to do. A credit card works really, really great because it's a nice sharp surface for taking off the excess. And I'm just gonna continue working right along, working on these edges. This process isn't a super fast process. This does take time to do. So you wanna make sure if you're a professional painter and you're doing grain fillers, make sure you bid it correctly. And I typically, on an average size kitchen, I'm typically charging $500 extra on top of my bid if I gotta do any grain filling. Cause it is, it's a process that does take time, but your cabinets will look absolutely amazing if you take the time and fill the grain. Now, once again, it does come down to, you know, your customer, what your customer's expectations are. There have been times that I have not filled the grain on cabinets because the customer's expectation, they wanted to see the grain. So I'm just gonna continue working it in. You do need to let it set about an hour before sanding. And some of that is gonna uh, be according to your temperatures. I cranked up the temperature in here, you know, above 70 degrees. So it'll dry a lot faster. When you're working on these contoured surfaces, it's, you can scrape it off with a credit card or you can even wipe it off with a finger on a contoured surface like this. I can take and wipe my finger on the edges just like that. And that works really well too. But I'm gonna get the bulk of it off with a credit card. And I do, when I'm doing my sanding, I'm gonna be sanding using a 320 grit. You don't wanna use anything too rough of sandpaper because it'll actually pull um, too much of your aqua coat out of the grain. So once I get the bulk of that off, I'm gonna wipe these rounded edges with my finger to smooth it out. And we'll set that aside to dry. So there's what it looks like. Now I got my drying rack right here. I'll do one of the larger, here's a larger one right here that's dry. And we're gonna sand that one here in a minute. And I'll show you the second coat. So about every couple, every couple drawers or doors, you're gonna to wanna to clean your tools because the aqua coat begins to dry on there. So I'm gonna hit it crossways. I'm gonna scrape it off. Just like that. The, this aqua coat, one of these quartz, a quart does about an average size um, set of kitchen cabinets. If you are doing just one vanity or um, a small, really small cabinet, a pint of it would be good enough. If you're doing a really large set of kitchen cabinets or you wanna buy more because you're doing multiple sets, uh, cause you do a lot of kitchen cabinets, you can get it in gallons also. I'll leave a link down in the video, the description where you can get this product if you're interested in using it. Once again, I've used multiple grain fillers. I've used um, some of the water-based, not water-based, and this is by far the easiest grain filler I've ever used. Easiest to apply, easiest to sand. There, if you have any questions about odor, 
it's uh, when it comes to painting kitchen cabinets, if you're doing lacquers, it's really strong odor. This product has a very, very mild odor to it. It's, um, you can barely, I can barely smell it at all. So I'm gonna wipe it down with my finger. You can wear gloves if you don't want to be getting this on your fingers. And now I'm gonna clean, after this door, I'm gonna clean my tools off. So once again, this stuff dries extremely fast. And I've got just warm water. So it just depends on you know, how often you need to clean it. it, just depends on how warm it is where you're at. Have yourself a nice you know, table working surface that you can apply the stuff on. And I'll show you, I got the door here. So here's a raised panel door. We're working on multiple projects. I got this um, vanity makeover I'm working on. And then I'm also working on another project. It's a laundry room we're working on. So now we got a raised panel door. What I don't want to do is get my aqua coat in these edges if I'm not caulking my um, panels. And I don't caulk my panels. So you got to be patient and you've got to be careful not to get it in there. So just take your time and just work around those edges because if it gets in there, it's, um, it just doesn't look good where it bridges the gap. So I'm gonna use something you know, tight like this credit card. And I'm just gonna take my time. And I'm gonna go along my edges here. See how I'm just, and if you do get some in there, I just would use my two edge knife to scrape it out, the blade. So now I've got it on there. I could use a larger tool to fill in. I could scrape it off now. And there's the center panel right there. Now I can begin working on my edges. And I'm gonna be very careful working on this routed edge right here too. I can use my finger. I can use a tool. I can cut a piece of my plastic that I have. But once again, usually the grain issue is not a problem on these routed edges, but you can even use a rag. I can take my wet rag. And just you know, wipe that routed edge just like that. Once again, it's a water-based product, so you can just wipe it off with a wet rag. One of the big advantages using AquaCoat. And once I get it all over this panel, I'm gonna use my wet rag to wipe all these edges. You can see I could take my tool here that contours to the edges also. Nice catch. If you do wipe it with a wet rag, it is gonna slow down the dry time. So you gotta definitely take that into consideration. I'm gonna try to scrape off more off this panel. getting close to where I like it right there. 
So that's the first coat. We're going to be adding three coats on here. We'll set that side to dry. And we'll begin working on our face frames now. If you have uh, a lot of dust, definitely want to wipe things down. Get the dust off before you do any aqua coat. These panels, side panels, are actually paper, but there's some holes that I did fill. I'm just running the aqua coat over, but now I'm just gonna do these face frames. Face frames are definitely a lot faster. See, just working it in, pressing it in, that grain, filling all that grain up, scraping off the excess. You can see why I used to, when they first came out with this stuff, it was clear and you couldn't actually see where the grain filler was and they improved it by making it white. Now you can see all the grain that it's filled. I'm gonna clean my tools once again, clean my hands. Now, if you're working on a door like this, and you know, you got routed edges, kind of complicated routed edges, if you need to, you know, scrape some out of the edges before it dries, you could just use, I just use my five in one to scrape it out of there so you don't have to sand it. If you get some down inside your gaps right here, you could just pull it out you know, with the knife portion of your two-edge knife and that way it's not bridging that gap. You don't want it to bridge the gap because it won't look as nice, but that's drying right there pretty fast and we're going to be putting on another coat here soon. All right, so I'm just continuing right along here. I'm gonna clear my space a little bit here so I have more room. We got a bunch of doors, um, larger doors we're gonna be doing. So we're not gonna be doing any sanding until our first coat dries. So that first coat, you definitely wanna let that first coat, depending on you know, temperature, dry time, you know, as manufacturer's you know, recommendations is an hour or more. Um, I've seen it dry as quick as 30 minutes and, and um, sandable. So on your final coat, your third coat, if you're applying three coats or two coats, uh, you would, uh, if you have the ability, let it set overnight, do a light sand with 320. I'm gonna be using um, Eka Silk. So Eka Silk, uh, very fine Eka Silk is rated at 320 grit. Um, for contoured surfaces, I'm using the half inch sponges. I also have the five millimeter, 10 millimeter. If I'm doing just flat um, surfaces like side panels and stuff, the Eka um, Silk, I just use the 320. And this is, um, I'm gonna be using my vacuum system, the Eka Sand Vacuum right there. Uh, so I have a dust free environment when I'm sanding and I'm not making a lot of dust. So we're gonna continue working on some of these big doors, check on how our drying's going on. We got one of them. This one has been over an hour. I'm gonna sand this one and show you what it looks like doing the next coat. All right, so I got my sander set up here. I'm gonna show you. So this has got some routed um, contoured edges on here. I'm gonna take a half inch very fine sponge. So it's 320. I'm just gonna put that on here we're going to sand it once again it's just a light sand basically so your second coat bonds really well so you do a light sand but on any of the like heavy areas where there's too much aqua coat you'll just sand that down a little bit more but So there's the door. So that's sanded now. And now I can apply my 
second coat of aqua coat, like rubbing it down with a tack cloth to make sure all the dust is off of it. So if you do get too much aqua coat on there, a 320 is not going to take it down very fast. You can use different grits. I usually keep um, some, also some fine and medium grit sandpaper. I've got it. Let's see if it's not, it's not on the table right here. I got super fine there. I'm going to grab some just in case you get some really heavy spots. I just switch out my sandpaper really fast. And that's what's great about the hook and loop, uh, three by four sander. You can switch it really quick. Now we're going to apply a second coat and it's just the same way I can use a credit card. I can use a tool. I got multiple tools. I'll show you using this tool here in just a second, but I've got some, flat areas. I'm going to apply, I went opposite direction last time when I applied it. I'm going to hit it going with the grain this time and then against the grain coming back the next way. So two coats, I'm going to, after I sand this coat, I'm going to turn on my inspection light I got right here. I'm going to check it out and see if two coats was enough to cover it or if I need to do a third coat. I mean, it looks like I've got it covered pretty good. Let's see, I'll use this tool right here. on these edges to scrape it out. Just it's looking pretty good. So there's a second coat. You can see it's a little bit more grain is showing up. So a little bit more is filled. All right, so we've got uh, two or one coat on everything. I've got two coats on some things. I'm going to do some sanding. Now I did find my fine. So I've got a uh, fine and um, very fine sandpaper. So if I got some places where there's a lot of aqua coat that I left behind, I can use like a fine, which is a 220. The very fine is a 320. So I'm going to start sanding these. I do have options where I can just use, you know, flat paper or I can use sponges. I can use five mils or 10 mil sponges. I think I'm going to um, hit these flat portions with my uh, five mil sponge. And here we go, the sanding. So I just got my Ekasan three by four sander and my vacuum hooked up. So you can see I'm sanding. I'm using, I switched to a half inch sponge to do the contoured edge portion right there. It makes it a lot easier, but my five mil sponge or even just flat paper uh, makes it a lot faster sanding the flat portions. If you're using um, a the flat paper, I, I don't have one. I, um, I ordered another one. Um, having a pad saver underneath here will save your pad. If you have somebody that's not using your sander properly, goes through the paper and could end up destroying the hook and loop on the bottom portion. So use a pad of a pad saver. I do have a pad saver over here, a sponge one, um, a stiff sponge that you can use. So basically it's just hook and loop on both sides. You put it on, put it on there and now if you burn through your paper, it's going to save your pad from getting ruined. So I could put, you know, my paper on there and I have now a sponge just like this sponge and I have a pad saver on it, but I'm very careful when I'm sanding. And once again, I've got a pad saver coming because I can't find my other one, but it's just going to make sanding your flat surfaces a lot faster and it's easy and quick to just switch from um, different styles of paper. So when it comes to sanding, typically when I'm doing cabinets or even in my trailer, I only keep, I keep the um, flat, um, just 
paper, um, sandpaper that's not a sponge and I always have the holes because I um, use it with a vacuum or I keep the half inch sponges and if I need anything in between, I'm using pad savers, you know, um, in between. And there are um, other options. There's what we call 10 millimeter. They're a little bit stiffer. And then there's five millimeter, which are right here. So you have multiple options of sanding with the three by four sander of different style pads. But once again, I typically only keep in stock in my trailer, these two styles right here for doing cabinets. So I do my flats with just the paper and then I do my contoured edges with the half inch sponges. Now we're gonna get on, I've got two coats on some stuff. I'm gonna apply a third coat on some, some of the stuff and then a second coat on another. I do gotta sand my face frame. So I'm gonna sand the face frame now here. We are working on multiple projects. So I've got um, our doors over here we're working on that were already painted doors. So I'm gonna get, um, I'm gonna do fine um, flat on those edges. We've got, so fine is a 220. So I'm gonna throw a 220 on here. You know, I had a 220 somewhere. Here's my 220 right there. First sand on these flat panels with a 220. All right, so let's get on with our second coat. The second coat is just a lot like the third coat, but I am gonna turn my inspection light on because I do wanna see what, um, um, my first coat and my sanding has filled and how much more I do got to fill because you know if you if you got a good inspection light you can tell whether you need to add a third coat or not I got this door right here that's got two coats we're going to take a look at it see what it looks like all right so this door right here we've got two coats on it it's been sanded two times I'm going to take a look at this I'm just going to use my inspection light I'm going to look down this door and this actually looks pretty good I would say that that would probably be acceptable at two coats, except I see a spot right here and here that I completely missed. And so that's the value of an inspection light right here. And once again, this just comes down to customers' expectations. What do they expect, you know, out of this um, makeover of this cabinet? I'm gonna look at this one. This one did have, there was a lot of water damage on this one because it, it's a vanity, so it's probably getting wet quite a bit. Um, it's one of the ones, the doors that open up, maybe it's where the toothbrushes were or something like that. And so the grain was a lot deeper, the finish was gone. This, this one right here is a drawer and this one is looks good. I mean, uh, the whole thing looks like I don't even need any more. Right here, this corner, um, is a little bit light, but I think my two top coats would actually fill that in. But I'm just going to go um, apply, um, and that's only one coat on that right here. This one's one coat. I'm going to just go and apply one more coat on all these, use my inspection light so I can see what's going on here and what I've missed and what I haven't missed. I'm going to use a microfiber cloth to wipe these down, get the dust off of them. Once again, we've sanded in between coats, so our aqua coat bonds well. On the back sides of the doors, I only do one coat on my back sides. So now I can see I'm using my inspection light to, to fill. I just I hit those spots that I can see that I missed right here. I can see I've, and you probably can't see it in the camera. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but um, see how good the cameraman is. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, get my knife and now I'm just gonna scrape the whole top. And what happens if you over sand, you sand you, you know, too much, um, use too heavy of a grit, you're gonna remove too much of the aqua coat out of the grain and um, you're not going to get you know really good results you do want to sand enough that you're you know um getting rid of the peaks and valleys of the clear coat that was you know underneath and i try to keep it off my hands the best i can i always try to look 
you know, neat and tidy for just in case that customer, you know, comes walking in and sees me working on their, you know, $1,000 vanity or working on their $10,000 kitchen cabinet paint job. I might end up getting some questions, you know, in this video on how much I charge to do cabinets and I'll give you a little hint. I charge um, per door or drawer front and now I have extra charges that I charge and one of them is um, if the cabinets are oak cabinets and I have to fill grain, I have an additional charge of $500 just to fill the grain on the cabinets on a small set of kitchen cabinets and that grain filling process could run up to um, as high as a thousand dollars to fill the grain on the cabinet. So you definitely, if you run it, if you've never done this on a set of kitchen cabinets before and you bid them the same way and you end up grain filling, it's going to take you a lot more time and you'll probably end up losing money if, if you don't um, add an additional charge to it. So I'll just cruising right along, looking in my inspection light. I can see like on my ends right here, right there. I can fill that with my finger. Got that one done. I can look at it in the light and you can even see if you got too heavy of aqua coat. And I typically, even on my first coat, I'm typically using an inspection light on all my coats all the time, but um, it, I didn't do it this time on the first coat because in the camera lighting, it um, kind of messes up our camera lighting and you couldn't see what's going on as well. So I just did without the inspection light the very first time. It doesn't, um, the inspection light's not as important because you're just really um, putting the aqua coat on the whole whole door because you got to get everything covered but I can see that's looking pretty good there I can see this whole side I missed that's what happens when you're talking and videoing sometimes you have a tendency to miss things talking, teaching, educating, all at the same time. Now I'm gonna gut this door here. I'm gonna do second coat on this door. And once again, I'm not, I, um, I do not take in um, caulk floating panels anymore on doors, um, but, and so I'm not caulking them on this door right here. There is a time and a place for everything and there's a time and a place to caulk them. And I agree with painters that do make the decision to caulk them, but I'm not caulking these here. And so I'm, this is a real difficult situation to deal with right there because it's hard to get aqua coat on that routed edge without getting it in that crack because I don't want to get it in that crack. So this door, this door looks pretty good. Now, if you're trying to give yourself a guitar finish, you know, on these cabinets, um, you know, one coat, two coats is not going to be enough. You're going to have to be skimming probably five coats of aqua coat on these doors, but um, I've never run into anybody that wants a guitar like finish on their um, cabinets. If you apply it in multiple different directions, it is going to, you know, fill the grain better. So apply it one direction, you know, um, one time you do it um, on the next code, try to apply it, you know, in the next direction. If you can, you know, remember what direction you went. In grain is always pretty heavy. Work on that in grain. All 
All right, we're gonna set this panel. So I got one, one more door to do, and then I'm gonna hit my face frame. See this? This door looks, the drawer front looks pretty dang good too. This one, two coats is gonna be enough on this one. Also, the one's gonna take three coats. So we're almost done with our aqua coating process, filling all this grain. One last, another thing I haven't said about aqua coat, it is a low VOC product. If you have a client that's concerned about you know, VOCs inside their house. If you're working in the house, um, it's a low VOC product. So you'd be confident, you know, you're not putting VOCs in the air inside their house. So it looks like I've got all the face frame done. And there we have it. Now we're gonna let that dry. I'm gonna do a final sand. So once again, my final sand, I'm gonna be using um, a very fine sand paper, which is a 320. I even sometimes go even a little bit finer than that. You definitely wanna make sure it's uh, really fine. So 320 or greater, that way you're not pulling any of the aqua coat out of the grain and exposing the grain again. And your final sand, you know, you should be your, your last coat of aqua coat should be really tight. And that way you don't have to do a lot of sanding and you don't have to over sand. So you're leaving the aqua coat in the grain. So I'm gonna get this cleaned up, um, get my tools cleaned up one last time and uh, sand, inspect and see what happens from there. All right, so now we're going to get onto the laundry room where we've got already coated cabinet doors and I'm going to show you the difference. So these are white and our aqua coat is white. So here you can see the wood grain. You can see everywhere you've gone with the, the aqua coat. Now we're dealing with another situation. These are oak cabinets, very similar to the ones that we got, but we're going to start applying our aqua coat and it's just going to take a little bit more time and a little bit more inspection and really looking and being careful where you go and then making sure you scrape off enough of the aqua coat so you don't have to do too much sanding so here we go we got me and michael are working on these so um let's get to work michael um we're gonna be applying this by the time we get done applying all these doors uh we'll we'll be able to start sanding our other doors over here so let's get i'm gonna be using Probably because I got larger doors here, I'm gonna be using some larger tools to apply it. Who's my long? You can see here to the camera, it's gonna be really difficult to see what we're applying. Once again, I'm gonna be really careful not to get anything in these, in the edges of the floating panel. These don't seem to be as grainy as the other ones. but I'm only working on one so far. The rounded edges, yeah, the rounded edges definitely have um, grain to them. But you are definitely, if you've got painted cabinets, if they're painted another color than the white, that they aren't white, it's gonna help you also. If you pre-prime them, pre-prime them, uh, like a gray color that will really help you. So there's some people that like to prime first. You can go ahead and prime first and you can use, you know, um, after, before and after you can use water-based primers or oil-based primers if you want. Almost got this door done here. We're gonna go check out what Michael's doing over here. We're working on this job together. The end grain is where the, the grain is really heavy, really deep. All right, so front side of this one's done. We'll be doing the back side. I'm gonna set this one on a rack. Check out what Michael's doing over here. All right, so we're just 
cruising right along, working on these panels. So the, this job is a little bit differently. So we've got these previously coated cabinets that the these panels, floating panels, are actually going to be caulked. The customer was adamant that they get caulked. Um, we're still going to try to keep the aqua coat out of the cracks because we're going to uh, use caulking to fill those panels. So some people, you know, caulk the panels. Some people don't. So it's uh, kind of a personal preference, and there is. You know, school of thought, some people are, believe that you should not caulk them at all, uh, but there are a lot of painters out there that do and have success doing it. So if you are working long periods of time, you know, using this stuff, it's good to keep your lid on your aqua coat so it doesn't dry out on the top. If you start to get, you know, dried stuff mixed with the wet stuff, um, starts to get a little bit messy these rounded edges take just a little bit more time a little bit more work because you're trying to fill in grain on these rounded edges so you just got to work it over the edge got the front side of this door done now if i take a look at it in the light like this i can see in the right light where I've gone and haven't gone because the aqua coat's wet and the door is flat white. So I am, uh, today I'm working with Michael, Michael Slanda. What is your company's name, Michael? Uh, it's Michael Slanda Painting. And you're, um, got a business where at? Here in, uh, we're out of Boise, Idaho. Boise, Idaho right here where I live. And how many times have you used Aqua Coat, Michael? This is my second time. Second time? Know. Yeah, so cool. um, the first time I, I uh, completed your cabinet course and that was um, in 2019. And then I took uh, that and went and sold the job and it came out great. And then from that job, I was referred to these people to do the same cool for their cabinets awesome so you've done a handful of cabinets now yes and it's just it seems like more and more um when you you find out that you somebody's done them and they've seen people in the cabinets last for you know 18 year, months and still look good right I'm starting to finally get the referrals and yeah. you know everything it's good. I like to keep my hands clean, tools clean, keep wiping them off every couple doors. So it's a, so Michael's got, he's got a rag with them and stuff. He's using to wipe his tools down. You don't want the aqua coat to dry on your n knives because it will end up ca causing rough edges on your knife, which it won't s scrape off smoothly. So. So I'm going to show you, this is a smaller door. I'm going to show you, you get questions, people asking, you know, how you work in tight spaces. So, you know, tight spaces just require smaller tools. So you got large tools, small tools, we've got large um, plastic knives. But if you're working in small spaces, just use a small tool. And I like to you know, not have a whole lot of aqua coat with me at the time, but if, I mean, if I was working small, here's a small knife, I can work smaller areas. So you, um, you primed these um, cabinets first, right, Michael? Yes, I, um, I was always afraid of tan and bleed, so I've used cover stain and then um, and I've, I've, I've just had good luck. I primed these about a week ago. So you like cover stain primer? I do for the stain blocking and the sandability. Um, but you know, it is an oil. So realizing now that there is other ways to go about, um, cutting out that step and, yeah. and not bringing the fumes into a client's home because now that everybody works at home, 
the more comfortable you can make it, I feel the better. If I was priming these themselves, if I was doing the, the painting of them and not just the aqua coating part, I like using Renner 851, which is a 2K top coat and Renner 643 is a 2K primer that is a uh, block pan in. So it's a 2K water-based primer. So I like really using water-based products and um, Renner's 2K 851 and 643 is an industrial PU that's absolutely amazing. What kind of pump did you use when you're spraying it on? Uh, I use a Titan 440. Uh, probably this one's got to be from the late 90s. Oh, it's one of my old old, my school. old pump is my oil pump um it was given to me by a painter when he retired so uh he said as if if i clean it right it will work until i'm done painting so i took his words to heart and clean it real good every time so cool and um yeah, I used your uh, 25 foot 316 green hose and a 310 purple tip. Um, and cool. that's how we did. So we're just cruising right along here and I just, you know, giving Michael some pointers. I, I don't like to work with a lot of product. I like to just work with, you know, a little product at a time and just be really neat and clean. I know I get a lot of people um, on my you know social media and stuff. You know, how do you keep your shoes so clean? How do you keep your pants so clean? And you know, to me, image um, is really important. Looking professional, acting professional. So I'm always trying to. I slow down a little bit. Don't work as fast. Keep my tools clean. I'm not using a lot of product. I'm just slowing down a little bit and trying to be really neat and clean and I kind of like you know if the customer walks in while you're doing this you know if you look neat and clean and tidy they're going to be pretty impressed and then all it is um you understand this Michael it just wins you more jobs just like yes. you're doing good work that you're you're getting a lot of work because of the quality of work you're doing you know Michael's um the customer said that they're just adamant these are are going to be caulked so the panels are going to be caulked it's what they want and desire so it's it's really ideal not to get um aqua coat in the floating panels and the gaps it's um better to use caulking because the caulking is more flexible I do get questions people asking you know what primer can i prime with um over the top of aqua coat so you know once the aqua coat dries you can um, use whatever primer you're familiar with if you're using oil-based products water-based products or lacquer-based products you're good to uh, prime with whatever you want i just highly recommend to me nowadays technology and water-based coatings um industrial pus uh, and this particularly renner is one of the ones that i use um, there's others that make some similar products like CIC and um, there's quite a handful of them out there that make good water-based 1 and 2 KPUs that just make it so you're not spraying um, flammable products for one thing in, in a customer's house nor are you smelling their house up because even when they're catalyzed, the, the odor is very low odor on the products. You have so it. we're just cruising right along, just applying your know, aqua coat on these cabinets. And you know, this is a job right here. You know, um, should you caulk the panels or should you not caulk the panels? And I do, um, I don't ever caulk panels on uh, doors anymore myself, but um, this job right here is Michael's got this job and I think, uh, so what did you got, um, what's the reasoning behind caulking the panels on this job? Did you say you had a designer that? Yeah, I, I had a client that has an interior designer and she laid out the whole project and they just handed it over to me and said, bid this, we want it exact to spec. And that was in there that was everything sealed and caulked on the cabinetry to give it a seamless look. 
And um, so I just took what was given to me and, and um, I, I just yeah. ran with it. Yeah, that's so um, basically, you know, Michael's got this situation where, you know, uh, the specifications spec for them to be caulked. And so, you know, if you want to be able to bid the job and do the job, then you're going to have to, you know, caulk them. And so, you know, you just got to be flexible as a painter. Sometimes, you know, um, even I can sit here and say, well, I don't caulk them anymore, but if I wanted the job, then I would have to caulk them. And, and then once, a bit, once again, you know, to me, this is definitely a situation where I would recommend caulking them. And with the success I've had, even though I don't do it now anymore, with the success I've had doing it over the years, I think this is, you know, a um, great situation where you will have success. It will look good. And these cabinets, these things are literally like over 30 years old. And so the quality of them um, when they were built wasn't as good of a quality, you know, build. They're a little more, not as expensive of a cabinet. So, you know, you just got to take every situation, you know, and look at the situation and determine, you know, what should you do in this situation? Also, climate has a lot to do, you know, with um, should you caulk your panels or not caulk your panels? So our climate here in Idaho is an extremely dry climate. And um, so you don't have a lot of expansion and contraction and uh, you don't have a lot of moisture. It's very, very dry, very arid. But we live in um, Boise, believe it or not, is high desert. So, um, you know, it's, we do have success caulking them. If you lived in a really wet climate, like down by the coast, you know, maybe caulking the panels wouldn't be recommended. So you really have to look at where you're at, the climate you're at, and um, you know, what type of doors you're dealing with, what type of wood species you're dealing with, and um, do the panels actually float or not? Grab these panels, even on these doors here, um, I can grab, I sh showed you this panel, tight, does not float. I can grab this panel, try to move it around, and that thing is tight. It is not moving around. There's not gonna be any expansion, contraction, and any cracking of the caulking. And also, your top coat. If you're using a lacquer as a top coat, if there's any expansion and contraction, the lacquer um, would be more likely to uh, crack and break than if you use, say, like a water-based Renner coating that's more flexible, like a PU. You're gonna um, have more flexibility, less likely that it's going to crack. So you, it's really just, you know, every situation, you just have to take every situation, um, evaluate the situation and determine what's the right thing to do. And once again, I know there's some people out there that just believe that you should never caulk a floating panel ever. But my challenge would be, you know, to ask, you know, that person that says that, have you actually ever seen a floating panel that was caulked and have you gone back and looked at it you know two years later three years later because um, once again i've i've actually caulked um, and done full sets of kitchen cabinets lots of them in the boise idaho area and i've never once got a call back on them and i've been doing them for years probably uh 10 years maybe something like that um caulking panels and not one call back so you have to go by you know history and record also um if you did them and you got called back because they cracked then um maybe that's something you shouldn't do um, but use to me use a good quality caulking like even an elastomeric caulking tower tech elastomeric their lifetime warranty caulking would be a great caulking to caulk floating panels with um, doesn't dry as fast as the quick dry um like you, you michael you use bolt is it quick dry yeah or, is that what you said bolt I was no. using Loctite, the Loctite. Loctite. And it's it's just like the white lightning. Uh -huh. Um and I um and it and it comes in a already pre-cut very small tip, so it lays really nice beads and it dries it paintable in 30 minutes. So um this is my uh second project using it, my first one that I did last year, I used it on and it worked very well. So So you've been a professional painter for a long time. Uh, Michael, and um, are you confident caulking the panels? Um, I'm saying from 
on these panels, I'm very confident in the process that we've done um, in the in the products that we're going to use. But I um, will definitely in future when we have jobs like this, we'll um, explain to the client that leaving them uncalked will could be a uh, better option for the panels to be able to move in the climate that we have here. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, you brought up a good point in um, speaking to the client. And so it's, it's really client expectations and um, going over them, what the expectations of the end result of the job is. And, and I know I ran into this one. This is why I actually started caulking panels on cabinets is I didn't used to caulk them because I said, you're not supposed to, um, you cannot because of the floating panels. And so I did this really high end expensive job. Can, the customer was adamant I caulked the panels and I convinced them not to. And then when we were all done, the customer was extremely unhappy with the job and was extremely unhappy that I convinced her, you know, to not caulk them. And if I wasn't gonna go back and re them and repaint all the cabinets, she was gonna go hire another paint or two. And so unfortunately, you know, I made a client unhappy and that's not what I'm in this business for. And so we turned around, caulked them, re-sprayed them, and even I thought they looked better when they were caulked. And so um, I started caulking them after that point. But then I always went over with the customer, explained, you know, uh, why I would, why I wouldn't, and um, the drawbacks and what could possibly happen two years from now, three years from now, and just explained in detail and went over it, you know, with the customer. And um, then they always knew what to expect and um, knew what they were getting into. It's the same with applying grain filler on these oak cabinets you can see the grain what, what's the client's expectation the end result I mean these would be after they're painted um, th this is gonna be painted white you would see really dark uh, um, shadows and holes and pinholes in that and 90% of the time the customer is not gonna be happy with it so we use aqua coat to um, fill the grain and I go over that with the customers expectations because I charge more to do that but I make it very known you know what the expectation expectations are that if you don't apply the aqua coat this is what they will look like and you know um, you may be unhappy with it and then it's good to show them an example of a door that's not aqua coated and a door that is aqua coated so um, to caulk or not to caulk that's the question so as, as a painter you know there's there's a time and a place really for you know everything I guess I'd have to say and you know as a painter it's um, I, I would say it's probably just be flexible you know you can um, be flexible with the rules I mean there are some times that you know you can be flexible um, do things do it one way or do it not not another way or even you know, if you don't believe you know uh, caulking the panels is the right thing to do um, that's okay too you know but be flexible with um, whether somebody else believes that you know they should do it or not and once again the Michael's got to be he has to be flexible with this job because the client wants it you know and that's what the clients expectations are and they want these things um, they want them caulked and that's what um, the designers expectations are on this job who's um, involved in this who's doing all the specifications for the job and so the designers has probably had experience with cabinets um, being um, caught, the panels being caulked, and that's what they want. And I think one thing is if the designer specs that and you do it and it doesn't turn out right, then um, I think that's kind of like on the designer. So you have a little bit of a protection there. All right, so we're just finishing up um, working on this job and just want to just you know, close out, you know, should you caulk or should you not caulk? And we've got two situations here. We've got, you know, a situation where I'm not gonna caulk the panels. And we've got a situation where Michael is gonna caulk the panels and, and really it's just being flexible, you know, as a painter and be flexible with what the client wants or even what the designer wants and what their needs are. So, um, you know, should you caulk or should you not caulk?
every situation is different. All right, so I'm here doing a cabinet makeover uh, today, and actually this is a multiple day project, and we're making over a vanity and making over a, a bathroom, and I'm doing, um, applying some aqua coat, doing some grain filler on this um, oak vanity, and it was a $25 vanity. We're gonna make this thing look like a $500 vanity when we're done, and so we're doing the aqua coat, and I'm sanding in between coats on the aqua coat, then I'm gonna be painting it with uh, our product from Renner, Renner 851. And we're gonna do some tests, spraying it with um, an airless sprayer and spraying it with an HVLP. But I've got my sanding system right here and I'm gonna talk about you know, how I go about sanding aqua coat, the abrasives I use and the sander I use and even the vacuum I use. So I got an Ekasan vacuum right here, the Series 2 vacuum setup, it's a HepaVac. And that's how I do a dustless sanding. And I've got my three by four sander. This is what I use on all my cabinets right here. Three by four hook and loop or flocked style uh, sander right here that is hooked up to my uh, sanding system, my vacuum right here. And it makes for a clean job site. And if you're doing any sanding and you don't have it hooked up to a vacuum, you're just gonna have dust everywhere. It's eventually gonna contaminate your coating. So you do wanna have some type of a vacuum hooked up. So what I really like about this system is the sanders hooked to the vacuum and the vacuum turns itself off when I'm not sanding. You'll see I'm gonna hit the sanding paddle to turn it on. When it's not being used, it turns itself off, which is really, really nice. This is a really high-end system. Three by four sander right here makes it really convenient for doing cabinets and doors. I do have a five inch and I have a six inch round, but I would say 90% of the work I do is with this three by four and you really don't need um, those larger uh, style round style. You can use them on like big large side panels on um, refrigerator side panels, stuff like that. I use them on decks and things of the sort, but when I'm doing just cabinets, face frames, um, the cabinet doors, uh, even the side panels on the um, refrigerators, I'm not gonna bust out a bigger sander, I'm gonna use a three by four. And this is the Eka sand right here, and it's absolutely amazing sander, um, low vibration, uh, it's a variable speed sander, so you turn it on, and I can run it, I believe, from 4,000 to 9,000 RPM. I think the five inch and six inch run from 4,000 to 10,000. Um, if I'm off to go back and check the specs, but I'm pretty sure that's what they're set at. You can see I can turn it on, turn it off, click of a button. So I don't, I don't know if you've heard, but I was actually adjusting the speeds on it. So it's got a plus and a minus on it. Very simple to adjust your speeds. And, and there's gonna be some certain situations, certain scenarios where you can um, lower your speed or increase your speed. I'm typically, when it comes to uh, working on cabinets, always run it at, at high speed. And I'm gonna uh, show you and demonstrate you how this thing works and how versatile it is. Now, when it comes to sanding with a sander, a power sander, you're gonna be sanding um, like three to four times faster than you would be if you're doing it by hand. It makes sitting here trying to sand profiles by hand so much faster, so much easier and dust free when you've got a power sander like this and a commercial style power sander of this magnitude. Now, um, it is, it, when you look at the price of it um, on its face, it's fairly expensive, but you know, a couple cabinet jobs that it's going to pay for itself. So um, you definitely want to get something like this, similar to this, if you're doing a lot of cabinets. Now the hook and loop system on here, you can put pads on here quickly and easily change from pads, different style pads. You can offset your pads. I'm going to show you what offsetting your pad does in different situations. And so the hook and loop system works really, really good. I'm gonna go over some of the size pads that uh, I use when I'm sanding cabinets. I've got 
from um, just film right here, thin film, all the way up to half inch. I do have five mil and 10 mil sitting here, and there's different scenarios that you can use that. When I'm doing cabinets, I'm typically using, uh, I just stick with film and half inch is what probably 90% of my work does. I do have um, in my trailer uh, other different sizes. I have the five mil and the 10 mil for different scenarios, and we'll talk about those scenarios. But I'm doing aqua coat right now, applying aqua coat and I'm trying to eliminate all the grain. And in order to eliminate the grain, you have to have a very, very flat surface. And so I'm gonna be using film tech to on all the flat surfaces. And then I'm gonna use a um, half inch sponge for anything profiled. And you're gonna see how uh, doing profiled rounded edges, beveled edges, contoured edges is absolutely easy, fast and efficient with this type of system. You, the, the pads come with holes in them. It also comes non-holes. They have vacuum, um, vacuum sanders where you can hook up the vacuum. They also have non-vacuum sanders if you're not hooking it up to a vacuum. So you can get holes, non-holes. When I'm outside working on a deck, um, something like that, I typically don't use uh, a sanding, um, a vacuum and stuff because they just blow the deck off and dust off. I'm typically using um, non-hold pads and so non-vacuum hold pads. So um, I'm going to show you, let's get on, I'm going to show you a demonstration of how this half inch works on this door and what makes it so effective. I'm going to show you right here, I've got a door, this is a um, recessed panel door. It's got a floating panel. And you can see, I can take this pad, just press down on it lightly, and it contours to that edge. Now I can sit there and sand these contoured edges. I can sand these beveled edges, rounded edges, very simply and easily with this system. I'm gonna turn on the sanders. I can't talk when the sander's on, um, so, but I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Now I can, I can offset this pad. I can work just like this in this routed edge, this recessed panel, just like this. So there was a quick demonstration of sanding with my um, Ekasan 3x4 sander and I switched to um, various styles of paper and sponges when I was doing that. And I'm gonna talk about you know, uh, the advantages of some of their products here, why I use some of these products from, um, from Unita. So Unita is the company that manufactures all these products that have these various names to them. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about now the Ecosilk line of products I use and also film tech and um, even the uni sponges that I use right here. And these are all the abrasives that I use from, from um, 
from Unita and their abrasives, I really like their abrasives because they're extremely durable abrasives and they last up to 30 times longer than conventional abrasives. And one of the, I'll start off with the non-sponge abrasive I use and that's Film Tech. And Film Tech right here, this is um, a film and basically in uh, simple terms, it's plastic. So our abrasive is actually uh, put onto a plastic film and it's held on with a resin on there. And this film is extremely more durable than paper. Paper has a tendency to rip, tear, wear out significantly faster than film. Film, you can't rip or tear film because it's a plastic, so it's very durable. It's not gonna tear on your surface when you're, you, especially when you're sanding on profiled edges and stuff like this that are got sharp edges and stuff. Paper will have a tendency to cut and tear. Film tech, uh, typically can, uh, in the past, paper was a lot cheaper uh, than uh, film was. Now film is about, as, uh, is about as inexpensive as paper is too. So there's not a lot of cost savings if you're going and buying paper. So film tech, these are film tech uh, three by four uh, pads that I use on my sander. The next thing I use uh, the most often is a half inch sponge and this is an open cell sponge right here and the abrasives on here are aluminum oxide abrasives that are on the, the on all the braces that we have here the sponge it's a very soft sponge and it contours to beveled edges uh, rounded edges and um, contoured edges and stuff like that and it's really great for working on these on these cabinet doors and a lot of the cabinet doors most of them have some type of panel system on them so i'm using that half inch sponge quite often on all rounded corners beveled corners and edges i do not use them on anything flat no flat surfaces and i'll discuss why uh, i don't use them on flat surfaces here now all right, so on the contoured surfaces, rounded edges, anything, I'm using a half inch sponge, a half inch sponge on a flat surface, especially when I'm trying to eliminate grain, like on these oak panels and stuff. If you use a sponge, what's gonna happen is your abrasive, the grit or the sand, whatever you wanna call it, the lumina oxide is gonna recede up into the sponge. It's gonna contour to your grain and you're not gonna get a flat, smooth surface. And in, a, in effect, you're not gonna be eliminating the grain. What we're trying to do is get this extremely flat. So anytime I sand on flat surfaces, I'm gonna be sanding with film tech. Now you can sand with a five mil sponge on flat surfaces. Um, Unita does have uh, videos and they do recommend and say that you can use a five mil on flat surfaces and that's very effective. I like to just stick with film tech because I want my surfaces extremely flat, especially if there's any type of grain. If you're on a non-grainy wood like birch or maple or something like that, these five mil pads you know, would be great. Now I'll get on to there's 10 mil pads and I did flip over on this door right here on the back side of the door, I flipped over to a 10 mil pad when I was doing this back panel and this kind of resembles a shaker style door. And on the shaker star door, when I had this paper or I had the film on here, I was sanding with the film, I hit my actual sander, hit the edge, vibrated, and you could damage your sander or damage the edge. And I'll show you and you will hear what it sounds like here when I do this. So now I just switched over to a, a 10 millimeter sponge and here's the advantage of a 10 millimeter sponge. And one of the reasons why Unida created it is for shaker style doors and they're very common doors and a shaker style is typically a little bit higher than that. But what's gonna be happening is your sponge, you can see the blue is actually gonna be hitting this edge and not the, the, the yellow portion of your sander. You're not gonna get the bounce and kickback, that vibration, you're not gonna damage your sander. So you can see what it looks like here. So 
So that's an advantage of a 10 millimeter sponge and it's why you might want to have a 10 millimeter sponge you know, in your arsenal of abrasives. Now you can't carry every, every abrasive in every situation. If you're not doing shaker style doors, you can see this door, this recess panel is not, this is just the back of the door. A five millimeter sponge actually has the same effect on the back side of this door right here. When it comes to sanding cabinets, I will talk about, you know, what grits I use, but I'll get on to a few of the we, other sponges we have uni sponges right here and these are sponges when you got to work on getting in tight spaces and stuff or you got to do any just hand sandings in every now and then you're going to have to just hit something by hand you can just use these sponges to hit stuff by hand i get down in these corners so i do always have a certain amount of hand sponges available to do my final hit with my door. You can see we've got all the grain pretty much eliminated in there. I do have an inspection light right here. When I'm sanding, I typically always have that inspection light on, but due to um, the lighting when it comes to the camera, um, it messes up our lighting. I will turn it on so you can see what it looks like here in a minute. But if you're gonna have perfect looking cabinets um, with no defects, nicks, dings, or anything in it. You need to be running an inspection light at all times when you're uh, inspecting, painting, and sanding your cabinets. So just wanna talk about um, my uh, film tech abrasives too, because I use the film tech a lot, but it's probably um, one of the most common abrasives I use in the film tech. Once again, I said it's a plastic abrasive. It's a sterated abrasive too. So it has a resin on there and then it's sterated. And what steration is, it has a lubricant on there that um, helps stop loading of your sandpaper. So loading, if your sandpaper starts to fill up with what you're sanding, it starts to what we call load. And if you're running it on a machine, it gets loaded up, it's gonna add to heat the um, the heat of um, the abrasive starts to get hot the machine will start to get hot machine can overheat and then it could shut down but as your abrasive gets hot gets loaded it's going to start to and when you're dealing with latex coatings some latex coatings it will cause them to ball up and gel up and get really soft and it just makes a big mess so steration helps um, lubricate the sandpaper, it helps get away um, the dust from the sandpaper, moves it away and helps keep it, it helps keep it run running cooler. All right, another little tool I wanna show you and I keep handy uh, is what we call an interface pad. And if you only have film tech available or you only want to use film tech, you can take film tech and turn that into basically a sponge or like a half inch a uh, sponge sanding pad. And now I've got myself a half inch sanding pad by using a half inch interface pad. And now I can do the same thing with film tech and get it to contour to certain edges. Now the interface pad, because it has a hook and loop or what we call flocking also on both sides of it, it does make it stiffer than the actual half inch pad itself that's just not an interface pad so this is a lot softer will contour more but this is a versatile tool they do have what we call pad savers and you can put a pad saver in between this and your uh, film tech which you typically always want to run a pad saver it will help um help keep heat down it'll also also help stop swirling too by keeping a pad saver under there and if you got employees not paying attention burning through your paper or wearing through it you could end up um, messing up your hook and loop on your pad right here and then you're gonna have to replace it a pad saver is just gonna increase the life of that pad i don't have it on here right now because i forgot it in another job site so um, it's good to have multiple of those but i'm very very careful when using my sander that i'm not wearing through on um, past my pad, but film tech being a plastic, it's really difficult. If you're using paper, it's gonna wear through the paper a lot faster and that's where you could damage your hook and loop. Now I wanna talk about, kind of went over all this stuff, I wanna talk about you know, what abrasives I carry because there's a whole line or what, um, 
what grits I carry because there's just a wide array of grits to carry when it comes to cabinet painting. But I, I don't have very many. I typically use 220, 320, and then like a 450. And so these are rated, my film tech, it's, it says 320, it says 220. I keep 320, 220 for cabinets. When it comes to the um, Eka Silk, the Eka Silk's rated very fine. It also has fine, and then I've got super fine. And the super fine, there's a super fine one right here. Super fine's around a 450. The, um, the fine is around a, a 220, and a very fine is around a 320. And they do have a chart. I have a chart on our website that will give you the breakdown of where they actually fall in there. When it comes to sanding, you know, the aqua coat and using um, the, uh, and sanding grain fillers and stuff, I'm, I sand my grain filler with a 320. Um, and then I'm using a 320 in film tech, and I'm also using a very fine in the Eka Silk Plus right here. And the Eka Silk Plus, the 10 mil and the 5 mil, these are closed cell sponges, so they're a lot denser than the half inch, which is an open cell. It's a lot softer. And so the 5 mil, that's why the 5 mil, because it's closed cell and it's only 5 mils thick you can actually use it to sand flat surfaces. So there you have it. That's, this is pretty much my whole setup. This is what I use um, in the variations of what I use when it comes to uh, painting cabinets, uh, doing grain fillers on cabinets and stuff, and the abrasives I use and the sander and the vacuum system I use. I'm gonna do another vi uh, video that specifically goes over this vacuum and tool system setup that I have and why I use that. But I use Ekasan, it's the best sander I've ever used, best abrasives I've ever used, extremely durable products, professional quality products that last up to 30 times longer than you know other sanding products out there on the market. Simply amazing tools. All right, now we've got our cabinet right here. I'm gonna give you some tips or tricks, what tape I use, um, the mask I use and stuff like that, how we go about paint or masking these cabinets off to keep overspray out of the inside. How do you keep overspray off your cabinet or off your cabinet or your appliances, off your floor and everything else you don't want paint on. We're gonna be spraying with an HVLP and an, an airless sprayer. We're gonna talk about the differences between those after this video, but this is all about masking. And so we're gonna show you how we mask off where the drawers go on the face frames, where a door goes on a face frame, even a drawer that can't, drawer front that can't come off of a drawer. We're gonna show you that. What I typically mask when I'm doing cabinets, I'm gonna use either a production tape. I like frog tape, orange, um, production grade tape or I like frog tape production grade blue tape and these two tapes are excellent for um, masking. This one can stay on a lot longer. If you're gonna be masking your cabinets and leaving your tape on, this is gonna be able to stay on there significantly longer and it'll come off a lot easier than a production tape. So if you're gonna be uh, leaving it on more than three days, don't use an orange production tape. This is a three day release tape. So I'm gonna get ready here. We do have um, delicate surface tape from Frog Tape. I'm not gonna be using that on uh, this job. We also do use orange tape if we wanna keep any bleeding off of floors and stuff. The blue tape comes um, packaged in multi-packs, doesn't have individual packing, so it's a little less expensive than your green um, tape with premium paper, but they both have paint block technology on the edge that swells up and doesn't allow anything liquid to bleed underneath the tape. But now we'll start on, and I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks masking the boxes right here, the face frames. And when I'm masking the face frames, I'm always using a inch and a half tape or larger. You can use larger, but then it's gonna cost significantly more money. There's a big savings in tape if you can use inch and a half or smaller 
tape. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, don't forget hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. That way you get notified every time we come out with a new video. It's free, simple, and easy to do. It's never costed you a dime in 12 years, and it will never cost you a dime in the future. It's just a simple way to help support our channel. Hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, um, and you'll be subscribed. On with masking a box. So now I'm gonna be going to be masking where one of the drawers is. I'm gonna be taking tape right here and I'm going to be putting my tape inside my drawer front and I'm going to be masking it just like this sticking the tape to the back side of my opening right here and this is what your paper is going to stick to is the tape that is facing you right here so it's going to be tearing off links approximate links stick it behind now I actually have the luxury of you know, working with a cabinet I could reach over the top of right here because this is a cabinet we pulled out of a bathroom that we're doing a remodel on and a cabinet makeover remodel. We're taking a oak cabinet and $25 oak cabinet and turning it into a $500 oak cabinet. So it's going to look just like that. So I'm going to do that with all my openings. And I, once again, I can use blue. You can use inch and a half tape or one inch tape, but it doesn't give you as much room for air when you're putting your paper. I'm going to be putting paper over the face of that. So you don't have, you can do the same thing with one inch. It's just this gives you a lot more adhesive surface to play with when you're putting your paper on. So I can stick this up inside here. Because you want to get make sure you have enough on the backing so when you push on that or when you're spraying, it doesn't push your paper tape off. All right, I'm gonna start masking the drawer guide that has, or the, the drawer front that has a guide on it. So I'm going to put masking right over the face of this guide right here so I don't get any overspray on the roller itself. Now I can put my masking behind there. And once you've done this long enough, you'll get pretty fast at doing it. So when I get to the bottom down here, I'm going to mask along my edge right here. I don't want anything bleeding onto my surface right here of the cabinet. So I'm going to mask that nice and tight to make sure we get a nice crisp line there. All right, so I got to all my face frames all masked for my drawer fronts right now. Now I'm gonna take and cover them with paper. I'm gonna use paper to cover it up. Show you how to go about doing that. going to stick right to the face and the paper is going to stick just like that. Now I'm going to flip this up. And that'll stick just like that to my face. Now I can fill it in. I can use, if I want to use production tape, I can take and fill it in with production tape. If I'm really conscious about trying to save money, I can just use, you know, um, one inch production tape. Just to make sure I don't have any leaks or holes there. You can even take switch out to blue, put production tape on this portion of it and just use one inch to save yourself some money. When you start masking off 
a lot of boxes could save you could save you a little bit of money just take your time measure it out don't get too far if you're short a little bit that's where you can just put a piece of tape that'll stick to the face of that adhesive and cover that leak. Same right here. That would be a leak right there. Easy to fill that in just like that. Come down to the bottom where we got our masking line along the bottom. There we go, now that's all masked off, ready to go. And one of the tips when I'm spraying this, we're typically using an HVLP sprayer at about 4.5 PSI, so really, really low pressure. If you're spraying with an airless sprayer, there's a lot more force on this masking. You definitely wanna make sure it's pretty tight. And if you're using an air sprayer, if there's any leaks, it's gonna throw way more paint inside there. So you definitely wanna make sure your masking is really tight and leak proof if you're spraying with an airless sprayer. And try to spray at the lowest PSI you can if you're using an airless sprayer so you're not putting so much force on your masking. All right, now I'm gonna show you how we mask typically where the doors are because they're significantly taller and our paper won't reach that gap and we don't wanna have to put masking in the middle which makes kind of a weak spot. So we mask with plastic and I'm gonna show you how to do that with plastic. All right, now I'm gonna mask off my opening. I'm gonna start by just putting I'm masking down on the bottom and masking off the white melamine here first because I don't want any paint bleeding onto my white melamine. Throw a piece of masking down there first. All right, now I've got my masker set up with my film right here and one inch tapes. I'm gonna do the same thing I do with the paper. Just gonna measure out my plastic right here. Tear it, set it. Get in place. Now I'm just gonna roll my plastic down. Tack it to your adhesive. can make sure I don't have any leaks along here. This flap, we wanna just take and tack that down. Just like that. If I was you know, unsure if anything was gonna leak along that edge, I can take, just throw some masking along that edge. That's gonna guard against any leaks on both sides. Just like that. All right, now I'm gonna mask over the top because I don't want any overspray going inside of our cabinet.
there we go. We're going to be spraying the sides of it and now we're good to go. So you could run into a scenario where your faces of your boxes are glued on there or screwed on there or nailed on there some way that you can't get them off. It's really rare, but we do run into that every now and then. And what we do is we just paint the boxes themselves just standing up like this, but we don't want to get any paint or overspray inside the box. This one actually screws on. So we would just act like the door is still on. All right, now in order to mask this box, I'm just going to take Just wrap my masking around the entire box. Just start from the bottom. I got one more row of masking. this now that box would be standing up just like this the door front would be on this box and now I can spray this box right here just like that and all the overspray is going to carry down this thing overlapping like this you're not going to get any overspray inside your box if you were spraying the back sides of these doors you would flip this over you would spray the back side first right here let that set up flip it over now you spray the top and the front and you're not going to get any overspray over that's what it looks like spraying the drawers the boxes if the fronts do not come off so now if you if, if this cabinet if these were cabinets inside of a kitchen we're also going to be masking the floor off i do have um floor shell we do use um x board is probably the most common uh, um, covering we put down on floors to protect the floors because nothing will absorb through it. It's actually waterproof and we'll run our X board up to our kick plate and then we'll typically mask it with blue frog tape because we don't want anything bleeding underneath that. And we can show you some B-roll of a job that we've um, done recently with that. So we'd be masking off the floors, wrapping blue frog tape all the way around. And if you're using lacquers, the blue frog tape or green frog tape will have a tendency to curl up when you spray it. If you're spraying multiple coats, every time you spray another coat, you wanna take and run your fingers over that masking um, because it does curl up. So you wanna push it back down right before you spray. So a mask, um, use frog tape. You don't wanna use production tape. The frog tape blue and the frog tape green have the paint block technology that swells up that doesn't allow anything to bleed underneath. So you don't wanna get any um, bleeding underneath on hardwood floors or tile or anything like that. So you don't wanna use your production tape on the floor and you also um, don't want to peel up your flooring the coating on the floor and stuff like that if it's hardwood so you don't want to ever put production tape on a hardwood floor now you may also run into some appliances that need to be masked off because you can't remove them we typically like to remove the appliances sometimes you cannot so we'll mask those appliances off in place like a dishwasher a refrigerator um, a microwave usually we won't remove those so you might run into a scenario like that we'll show you what it looks like to um, you know, mask around a, a refrigerator. We use plastic, cover it up with plastic and get it in there, you know, as deep as we can, like on a refrigerator, open the door on a, uh, a dishwasher and mask, you know, inside as deep as we can in those cabinets. It's always best to remove appliances if you can. There are scenarios you're going to run into here and there where you just cannot, or there's way too much liability, you know, removing them from scratching floors, um, tearing vinyl, stuff like that, or even we've run into pulling refrigerators out and um, the ice makers begin leaking and that's a big liability moving a refrigerator out. We typically ask for the clients or customers to have those appliances removed um, prior to us getting there to doing the cabinet job. If you got any questions or comments, you know, about how we go about masking um, the products we're using. Just leave it in the comments section below. Uh, we'll try to answer those questions. Uh, the masking process 
you know, usually goes you know, usually goes fairly fast. And you know, once you learn how to do a few boxes, it's going to go fairly quick. It does look like it would take you an eternity to do a whole kitchen, but to mask off a whole kitchen, I can mask off an average size kitchen by myself. Uh, in probably about an hour and a half is all it's going to take you know to do all the masking of all the boxes and everything it's a very simple process you definitely want to have a masker this is an essential tool you definitely want to use frog tape so you don't get any bleeding you definitely want to use a tape that can stay on there for multiple days um, and that's going to come off really easy when you want it to come off like a 21 day release tape so versus a three day release production tape all right we're going to be getting ready to spray this cabinet now i've used aqua coat it's a it was a real grainy oak cabinet i used aqua coat to eliminate the grain hopefully we got all the grain eliminated after our first coat a uh, spray we're going to see how much of that grain is left and see if it's acceptable if we need to put more aqua coat on after the second coat but we're going to be using another um, item i have not ever used about and i hear a whole lot about it from do-it-yourself painters and that is the titan control max sprayer now the titan control max sprayer they have a whole line of them i've got a really small one right here and we're going to see if we can actually spray a cabinet and get really good finishes with it i get a lot of questions can you add a whip to that control max sprayer and we did come up with a conversion kit that you can put a whip on it now and we're going to show you that but it's a little inexpensive sprayer. It's a two, I believe around $200. Can you get an amazing cabinet finish on uh, with a $200 sprayer? We're going to find out here shortly. So we've got um, Benjamin Moore Advanced. Once again, I've never used it. It's a waterborne um, interior alkyd paint. So it's like a more oil modified acrylic paint and it has an extended dry time. So it dry, it takes about four to six hours to dry to the touch. So with that long dry time, that's what gives it the ability to, for you to be able to brush and roll it. If you're a do-it-yourself or, or even if you're a professional painter accustomed to brushing and rolling and that long dry time gives the paint the ability and the roping caused by, or the stippling caused by a roller or a brush, it gives it the ability to lay out. With today's technology and water-based paints, most water-based paints dry so fast, they don't really have time to level out. And that's why you get stippling and roping from brushes or rollers. You can um, add latex additives to the paint like XIM latex extender. It can extend the dry time and, and help you eliminate brush strokes, but this paint, was um, I believe designed specifically for that to get uh, spray like finishes with a um, product that you brush and roll. But once again, we're gonna be spraying it. I'm gonna be using a Tri-Tech 208 tip because I've just got small face frames of spray right here on the large sides. I'll probably switch to a 410 just to give um, Tri-Tech. I'm gonna be testing out the Tri-Tech tips here. They're fine finish tips, the gold tips. So we're gonna put those to the test right along with that Titan Control Max sprayer. All right, we're gonna get ready and start loading up our um, Benjamin Moore Advance to spray. Now, just the other key elements. It is a low VOC product, even when it's tented. I think it comes out to 50 grams per liter is uh, what the measurements are. If I'm wrong, we'll put it right across the um, board, the screen here. Once again, it has an extended open time. Uh, four to six hours. It has a dry time of 16 hours. That might be one of the drawbacks. I'm really accustomed to spraying cabinet finishes and getting on three to four coats in one day, sanding in between coats. You cannot sand this for 16 hours. It is a two coat product. So instead of spraying four coats, we'll be spraying two coats of this product and see how it performs with two coats. After 16 hours, you can sand it, wipe it down with a damp cloth and respray it again. We're gonna see how it sands. We're gonna see how it sprays. And once again, we'll see how fast it dries. It's about you know 68 degrees in here, um, not very humid at all. So uh, we're gonna see how it uh, brushes and rolls on a drawer on a horizontal surface. We're gonna spray it on a horizontal surface. So we're gonna um, spray it on a vertical surface also. Um, I think I gave you all the information I know about this product. Now let's um, get some information uh, real world now. This product is also supposed to be low odor. Put that to the test right here. Yep, doesn't have a very strong odor at all. So 
Um, there's some truth to the low odor portion right there. Gonna load up our sprayer now. This is a, a waterborne product and it cleans up with just warm soap and water. Uh, the viscosity, I'll show you what the viscosity of it looks like. It looks really thin. So I'm gonna wanna be really careful and not try to spray anything vertical in one coat or I could get runs. And so, and that's kind of what I heard about it is um, you wanna just spray light coats and not heavy coats or it will run really easy. So um, do a little research be on your product if you've never used it before. See if you can get any information on how it likes to be sprayed. But there it is. It's pretty, pretty thin. It's now it's probably like um, in my past using oil-based paints. That's about how we would spray oil-based trim paint. It'd be about that viscosity right there. I don't need, now if I was going to put it in an HELP sprayer, I'd wanna know my exact viscosity using a viscosity um, measuring tool like a Zon cup or a Ford 4 cup, but I'm not spraying through an HVLP. I'm spraying through this Titan Control Max and I'm even gonna use the gun that came with it. So I'm gonna get this thing loaded up and ready to go here. Now I'm going to make sure I run enough of the paint through here that I purge any air bubbles, you know, out of the system. If I don't get all the air bubbles out, I'm going to get spits. So I don't like to just spray out of my gun because it splatters really bad. I like putting on a six inch extension and it shoots out in a nice steady stream. That way I don't get a whole lot of splattering everywhere. <laughs> Now I want to run that till I don't see any air bubbles coming out of here. When I first pulled the trigger, a bunch of air bubbles came out. That's definitely going to cause spitting. So now I can take this off and spray without the extension. Any type of extension is going to cause spits. So if you have a six inch extension, you are going to get spits out of the gun. So if you don't want any spits, you need to take off your extension and go completely without an extension. The longer the extension, the bigger the spit is. So um, when you're spraying like 30 inch extensions and even greater adding multiple extensions, you gotta be very conscious and aware of starting and stopping off of your surface so you don't get any spits. With this product, if it did spit, I would assume it would level out pretty good. So we're going to get ready to spray the vanity. So I'm gonna just get this thing up on some stir sticks. So once again, it's up off my floor so, so we don't get anything sticking it's up off the floor. I don't want anything kicking up. I've done some sanding scraping, so I'm going to vacuum this real quick. All right, we're going to Get ready to spray here in just a minute. I got a respirator. I do, whenever I, um, when I'm using like um, modified urethanes, water-based modified urethanes or um, oil modified acrylics or anything like that, um, those products have a tendency to stick really, really well to your surface and they also have a tendency to stick really, really well to you. So I definitely like wearing gloves when I'm spraying and dealing with these products. So I don't get any of the product on my hands. If you do, I'll wash it off because it didn't, you know, pretty soon because it doesn't come off very easy in the shower by the end of the day. So I've got my uh, cabinet ready to go here. We've got it aqua coated. I do have an inspection light that I also use to keep where I can, I'm um, somewhere handy where I can check out my surface to make sure it's ready to spray. I'm just gonna dust it off real quick here. And then we're going to begin spraying. So just one final look over, I can check out my surface one last time to make sure everything is the way I like it. I do keep a tool belt with me just in case I need any 
tools. All right, we're gonna, going to get ready to spray here. Now what I don't wanna do is if I've never used the product before, I don't wanna start spraying you know, right on my product right away. I wanna put it to the test somewhere else. I'm gonna spray some right on the side of the booth here. Um, maybe even shoot some on the back panel, something, something you can see, um, not see. Start someplace like the back of the house. Um, if you haven't sprayed an exterior product before, don't spray the first time right around the front door. Go to the back of the house, the high side of the house or something. You know, just someplace that I guess what you'd call it is inconspicuous, something place that's not gonna show up as much. So if you run into problems, because typically when you spray a new product before, you never sprayed it before, there's always gonna be some trial and error to it, a learning curve to it. So this is really thin stuff. And um, I'm accustomed to using thick and thin products for trim and cabinets and stuff, but um, not this product. So we'll see how it goes. So I'm ready to go now. I got my my fan running, venting out the garage here. All right, we got to our first coat sprayed on there. I gotta say, um, one of the things it said, it had excellent coverage. So this was uh, white going over uh, basically a dark brown, kind of um, dark or medium brown. It covered uh, pretty dang good, pretty amazing. The sprayer functioned pretty well. I got a nice even coat, a uh, nice thin coat. I put it on really thin. I had the control max up at very high, the very high pressure all the way up to number five, I believe. It just has a dial, it just goes from zero to five, zero being off, it doesn't have an on off switch, zero to five. Turned it all the way up, sprayed it with a 208 tip. It actually worked, the 208 Tri-Tech tip worked pretty good on here. It looks like it's gonna level out amazing. I do uh, got some spots on here, I still need the aqua coat and um, before I sand and do my final coat, but it's definitely gonna cover in two coats. We are now going to spray our doors. I'll brush and roll a door and we'll see how that door comes out. All right, here we go. We're going to brush a drawer front now to put the Benjamin Moore Advance to the brush test. Does it um, flow out, level out 
where you don't have brush strokes. So, and that's really important for do-it-yourselfers that are painting cabinets and um, trim. So, I'm I typically if I was painting trim, if I was brushing trim, I'd be using a Premier Hampton brush. Or if I was painting cabinets, I always spray it, um, cabinets and trim. But if I was brushing it, I would want something really, really soft, like a 100% Tynox. Tynex brush from Premier. This is a really soft brush and it's going to give you the ability to paint and not have brush strokes. You're going to have better odds painting with this than a stiffer brush. What I am going to do, I'm going to put it on with a Hampton and then I'm going to lay it out with a Morton. So a Morton brush is a really stiff brush. It's um, people that like stiff or extra firm brushes. This is a um, Chinex and polyester brush right here, a DuPont filament brush. And I'm going to just lay it out with that because it's going to rope it or leave brush strokes uh, a lot bigger than a Hampton would. And we're going to see if it levels out. So we're going to put it to the test with a Morton. So I'm going to get my paint on here and see how this stuff performs brushing it. I'll even take in a roll one too and we'll stipple it really well rolling it typically with you know if you're painting a um painting cabinets or trim with a water-based paint they dry really fast you don't have a lot of working time so you're going to want to get your paint on get it on really quick and then lay it out and don't mess with it what do it yourselfers have a tendency to do is overbrush and overwork it and it's starting to dry or coagulate and that's when you'll start to get brush strokes this having a four hour four to six hour open time you're going to have a lot more working time to be able to mess around if you're not if you don't have a lot of experience with a brush just to take more time getting your product on i can get it on mess around with it i can see it leveling out like really fast already just in that short period of time, just getting it on there. Well, I'll just get some on here. Typically I would paint the back first and then do our fronts, but you know, we're just doing a test here with this product. And so I'm painting the front first because I've got some curved edges. I want to see how it performs on these curved edges. It, I can already see it's like leveling out. I got really nice ideal conditions in here right now because you know the it's you know in like high 60s uh low 70s about 70 degrees in here to be exact i'm gonna get this paint on then we'll just hit it with our morton and level it out Make sure all the sides are completed. Once again, you can't, just because of the dry time, you're not gonna be able to do this in one day. You're gonna have to paint one coat one day, paint another coat another day. So now I'm gonna take you know, a dry Morton, I'm gonna rope it with a dry Morton, get some good brush strokes in there. We're going to see how it levels out. I'm just continuing to work with it because, you know, I want to see when I'm messing around with it too long, like um, somebody inexperienced with the brush would be doing, you know, just to give it a fair shake and kind of more like a do it yourself or would paint some level out again. I can see it filling in the brush strokes extremely fast. This stuff brushes very, very, it actually brushes very similar to an oil. If you've ever used oil, oil-based paints aren't found around very many places anymore. A lot of EPA regulations are causing them to go away. That's why you're seeing these oil modified um, alkids now, waterborne alkids showing up. I got a little piece of debris on there. That's what I always keep my tool bag with me just for getting rid of things like this. There's something on the door right there. A piece of lint. All right. 
now that I've overworked it, put it really to the test, we'll see how well it levels out. Now I'm gonna take in brush and, or I'm gonna actually roll one and we'll see how, what the comparison is. And I can, I mean, I definitely can see brush strokes in it still, but um, you know, I just got it done. So we'll see how this thing's gonna dry out. My rack is a little bit too small. All right, so the better way to actually, you know, do this, I brushed the last one. You wanna take like a microfiber roller and you wanna roll the large fields and then you'd go back and back brush it. So I can just take, show you what it would look like. I'm gonna paint this a microfiber roller and then I'll lay it out with my brush. So now I can do the full field. You know, actually I'll think, I'll just leave this one. Um, I won't lay it out, I'll actually just leave it rolled to see how the stippling levels out compared to the brush strokes. And you can see, um, a little microfiber on there. Try to get a close up of how well this thing is stippled so you can see the end result. Try to stipple it really good. You definitely, if you're working on a horizontal surface like this, you can get more product on, on both coats. So there it is. I mean, the coverage is absolutely amazing. So that's, I mean, that's not covered 100%. I can see some speckles in there, you know, but um, it's definitely gonna cover in two coats. Definitely wanna, I mean, I see a little debris in there. My bucket wasn't 100% clean, but um, see some, you definitely wanna delint your roller as this roller left some microfibers on there, but you definitely wanna sand in between coats and and make sure that your second coat doesn't have any microfibers or debris in it. So there you have it. So we're gonna let that thing set, level out, and we'll sand it and coat it again tomorrow. Now, if you're spraying it, like worrying about the, the microfibers or the fibers or the lens coming out of your roller, you wouldn't have to worry about that. And then also if you're spraying it, you've got a manifold filter and you've got a gun filter filtering your paint, less likely that you're going to get debris in your paint like this, but make sure your, your bucket is extremely clean. Make sure your brushes are pretty clean. It's better to delint your roller. If you're doing cabinets, delint it with, a, um, with some tape and then I would go pre-wet it and pre-clean it. I've got videos on delinting and multiple ways you can delint it, but I would delint it, you know, with um, tape and then spinning it with water to get it pre-wetted and even cleaner because I definitely see some um, microfibers in there. So, you know, that's pretty typical with uh, new, new paints or um, new rollers that haven't been delinted. So I'm going to show you a product I'm spraying in this booth here. If I was spraying all day long, long period of times, or even doing new construction, here's something I discovered. It's actually pretty cool. And I typically would have a monkey suit on and I would have a hood on also. And I always actually just ripped a hole in my monkey suit so I can get my phone in and out because I'm typically taking calls, calls for bids and color consultants, stuff like that. You want to have access to your phone, but you want it to be, you know, protected. This thing is actually pretty cool and it sticks on the outside of your monkey suit and that way now you could have your phone accessible and you could actually see it and even if i was spraying outside and i didn't wear a monkey suit or if i was spraying in here if i wanted to protect my phone i have it in my back pocket but you, i'll show you what you can do this thing is pretty cool it just has a self-adhesive on the back of it pull the backing off of it and you would just stick it on your monkey suit wherever you want it. It's got a Ziploc right here and your phone goes right inside bag. Now it's protected. You can see if I have my phone upside down right there, I can see I can get calls, whatever, or accidentally make calls. 
just like that. Pretty cool. It's an uh, Insta Pocket from Trameco, and wearing them on my monkey suits is actually pretty dang cool. Now I don't have to rip a hole in the pocket where and now I can get all kinds of dust and debris down inside that hole and on my clothes. Just a handy little uh, trick to protecting your phone. So I'm gonna try to spray it. One coat here, two coats on the other sides, but today we're gonna get one coat on the backs of these two drawers. We'll flip them tomorrow and do our first coat on the other side. But I, th I think as well as this covered on the first coat, spraying it uh, vertically, I think I can spray it one coat horizontally and we're gonna see what that looks like. We're gonna put it to the test. All right, so I've got the back sides of two doors sp uh, sprayed. I've got the front side of two drawers uh, rolled. I've got the vanity sprayed. Do you have to say the, the Control Max, it sprayed the product on, didn't atomize the paint as fine as like my Titan 440 was, uh, would have, but I mean, this product is leveling out, so it's not really gonna be an issue. You definitely could get away with a fine finish tip of spraying using this sprayer. Uh, it's drying pretty fast. We've got two of the drawers that I rolled probably 20 minutes ago. They're already half dry. Uh, you do have to wait 16 hours once again to you can sand and recoat. It's dry to the touch in four to six hours. Now my cabinet painting process uh, I typically get um, the first day we spray four coats of our product on and sand in between coats. A uh, standard set of kitchen cabinets we can do in about two and a half days, and that's with three or four guys. You know, this process, you're definitely not gonna get your kitchen cabinets done in two and a half days like it would, because you're gonna have to do, um, if you're spraying them, especially horizontal, if you spray them vertical, hanging vertically, then you can get all four sides done and uh, still in two days. So we're doing them horizontally, so you're gonna have to spray two coats one side, flip it, two coats another side, that's four days, you know, versus uh, the product we're using. Now, we do have a PSDR rack over here. I could hang them and shoot all four sides, and that would um, eliminate you two days, basically, because you're spraying all four sides of the doors, and um, you would have to, once again, you're gonna be spraying them vertically, so just make sure you don't spray it on too heavy. I noticed I sprayed it on pretty light over here, and um, even though I thought it was light after it started to dry, it, you can see where it hasn't run, it hasn't sagged, but it's right on that border. So make sure my temperature is around 70. I would probably want it around 75 if I was spraying all my doors uh, vertically and even all my face frames. I'd want to crank that temperature up. But it's for uh, waterborne elk, it, it is drying very fast. The rolling, getting contamination from um, lints and stuff like that in there, you know, it isn't my favorite. But you know, for a product that a do-it-yourselfer could use, um, this it seems like it is going to be pretty forgiving when it comes to eliminating uh, stippling, eliminating brush strokes, and if you're not very good with spraying, you know, um, getting a good finish leveled out and not having. Um, it really eggshelly when um, when you're done spraying. So uh, this is the first day. So we're gonna come back tomorrow. We're gonna sand and get some more product on and continue to see how it performs. 
All right, here we are. It's day two. This stuff has sat overnight now and it's all dry, ready for us to put our second coat on. Prior to the second coat, once I've sprayed my first coat, typically like when you spray a primer coat or your first top coat, you, you may see some imperfections, some things that you don't wanna see in your final coat. I've got some things I'm going to hit with Bondo. I got um, some spots I'm gonna hit with aqua coat again and then we're going to begin spraying our uh, final coat, so our second coat. I did take a look at the doors. I got doors that are drawers I sprayed. The drawers that I sprayed absolutely came out amazing even though I sprayed it with a Control Max do-it-yourself sprayer. Pretty impressive. I've got an absolute glass finish on these things. I'm going to be sanding them one more time with my Ekasan and Film Tech to get a little bit flatter finish and eliminate some more of that wood grain. I rolled one and brushed one and I am pretty amazed that the roller marks and um, the roping and the stippling actually went away. When I look at the finish, it doesn't have that absolute glass like when I sprayed it, but it actually leveled out. So if you're brushing and rolling the product, it does what it says, it levels out. It did dry extremely fast. It said four to six hours to dry. I came out here an hour later, it was dry to the touch. So it did dry really, really quick. I don't know if you could sand it. Um, I'm gonna test adhesion. I'm gonna do a, um, a cross hatch test on it and see how well it adhered prior to spraying our second coat. But I'm gonna get on with uh, doing some touch-ups on here with some Bondo and some Aqua Coat. I am going to today, I'm gonna set up my PSDR system, how I typically spray cabinets. Uh, you can, a lot of you spray them flat, flip them and then spray them again. So you spray two coats, flip it, spray two coats, and then you would have your four coats and that's gonna be a four day system. I'm gonna be using a paint line PSDR system where I typically hang my doors up or I spray them up hanging so I can spray both sides all at once. And that gives you the ability to cut down two days because I'm gonna spray one coat hanging all four sides or all four edges and both sides. And then I'm gonna let it dry, come back the next day, sand it, shoot it again, and that's gonna be two days. So I'm gonna show you that system, how 95% of the time I shoot my cabinets in a spray booth like this. So let's get on with some touching up. So I do, I've got a few spots I'm gonna be um, bondoing. I've got some holes that showed up that I didn't see before, and I'm going to just hit those with a little bit of Bondo glazing putty. And this is not Bondo, it's uh, glazing putty. Dries really fast. I can um, fill some of these holes with it. There's gonna be a baseboard that's gonna be down here on this, so you, probably won't see that anyways, but I'm not sure where it's gonna be. Got a few other um, spots here, but this is gonna be covered probably with trim, but I'm just going to cover those nail hoods or nail heads just in case. Down here, there's going to be, I'm pretty sure a kick plate that goes over this, but I'm gonna just, just in case, fill this stuff in to make sure it's filled. There's a few places I'm gonna um, use my aqua coat to fill. I've got inside edges of these doors that I'm going to be doing just with my fingers. I'm gonna be wiping some aqua coat just to fill a little bit of the grain in on, on the edges here. That was a new aqua coat I'm gonna be just using one I've already opened up here. And just, I'm just going to be smearing it on with my fingers. It's gonna dry really fast. I'll hit this one final time when I do my final sand on these cabinets. But all this stuff is typically, it's really hidden by the drawers. The drawer sits right here, but I'm just going to be filling this in anyways, just to get it up. 100% covered, I'm moving the drawers. Now this one tilts down, so you would see the sides here when this thing tilts down. So just gonna fill that in with my finger. It's gonna, there's gonna be 
a drawer front mounted on here that folds out and so I don't need to put any on that. This is a door opens up right here. So I definitely want to get some aqua coat on this bottom edge. So we want this to be filled in when this door opens up. We want that to look really good right there. So we're going to fill those in just so you don't see those, those dark shadows created by the grain. And simply just putting it on with your fingers like this will work. There we go. Now I'm going to work. I got a couple spots on some drawers. I've got the back side. You know, this drawer didn't get coated in some areas with aqua coats. I'm just going to hit this. So I'm going to start setting up my PSDR system right here. And this is how I typically spray my cabinets, cabinet doors. I can get them sprayed all, all sides, all edges, all at one time. And this is this hanging rack right here that I use. You'll see what it looks like right here. They have made some improvements to this rack since I got mine. Now, uh, this has a dowel system. They do have a circular system now that you can hold and spin your cabinets from, but your cabinet doors from, but the cabinet's gonna hang from right here. I'm gonna spray it right there. I'll show you. All right, so I'm getting ready to mark my holes. What I do is I put holes in here to hang cup hooks. I use three quarter inch cup hooks. I use a template just like this that my, I got two drywall screws in there drilled in 10 inches apart. I can pre-mark my holes. I drill a 3 32nd inch hole. And I know this is the bottom of my door, so it's marked. So you'll never see these holes. So a lot of, get a lot of questions, you know, what about the holes? So this cabinet door is installed and it's this low to the ground right here. There's no way you could ever see those two holes. I'm going to now screw in two three quarter inch cup hooks and these cup hooks give it you the ability to hang your PSDR hangers on and hang it in on the PSDR rack so you can spray. So just two cup hooks just like this, screw them in. If your doors are really heavy, make sure you screw them in all the way. So your doors don't pull out of, or your hooks don't pull out of the door. So just like that, now this thing's gonna hang from my PSDR rack. It can hang from my drying rack. I got a drying rack set up over there. Spray them here, move them to the drying rack. So I'm gonna get holes done in all the cabinet doors. This is marked up right here. So I definitely wanna put it on the bottom. So my holes, this one's already got holes pre-drilled. Already did those. All right, so I've got my cabinet door set up right here to spray. You can see now I can take and spray both sides and all four edges all at once in one shot. So it'll dry in one day. I can come back, sand both sides, shoot both sides again, and then it'll be just two days. So I'm gonna get my blower going. Got uh, my spray booth set up here. I'm gonna spray this and you can see what it looks like spraying it.
All right, now I'm gonna do a final sand on my vanity and we're going to spray a second coat on this thing. All right, so I just wanna give you a couple pointers when you're sanding uh, with this um, Benjamin more advanced. So it, uh, it sands a little bit different than a lacquer or an industrial PU. So it has a tendency to you know, load up your sandpaper uh, really quick if you keep your sander in one place because it starts to heat up really fast. So just what I learned really fast as soon as I started sanding with it, that you just gotta move quickly. I got my sander at high speed. I turned it down to a lower RPM, which caused it to even heat up even quicker and load up my sandpaper. So it's uh, very simple. All you gotta do is just run at a high RPM. I think it's running around 10,000 RPM. It's at the highest setting and just move really quickly and don't over sand because if you try to over sand, it's going to start to heat up and then load your sandpaper. And what I noticed instead of um, sanding and turning to dust, it'll start to ball up just a little bit. So just a little simple tip. It does still sand well, just sands just a little bit differently if you're accustomed to sanding lacquers or even um, industrial PUs like I'm accustomed to using some other products that sand uh, just like a lacquer. So there you go, simple little tip. All right, so I'm getting ready to start to spray the second coat on the vanity. I know I'm, I always get questions every video I do, what color are you spraying? And this is a really light gray. It's a Benjamin Moore color, 2138-60 uh, gray cashmere. Gray cashmere, we get a good um, look at that. So. There you go, there's the answer to that question. All right, I'm gonna now spray once again, and I did notice after spraying yesterday and spraying today, what you wanna do is spray just really light fog coats and not a heavy coat, because it will have a tendency to run or sag. It covers extremely well, so you don't need to put heavy coats down. Okay, now we've waited 16 hours. I'm going to do my final inspection of these cabinets on my inspection table and do any last aqua coating if I need to get rid of any more grain. Some of that's gonna be customer expectations. You know, how much grain do you wanna see? The cabinets are looking pretty amazing, but I'm gonna do my final inspection and final coat, and I'm gonna be spraying, hanging up right here on our PSDR rack. So I'm gonna get my inspection table over here. And once again, this, having an inspection table, if you're a do-it-yourselfer um, or a professional painter, some type of inspection table is really gonna help you out. So these doors, I've um, actually did a, another coat of aqua coat on them last night, and these things, are looking pretty dang amazing. But when I get my ins my inspection light on, it will show any type of imperfections and that you may wanna fill with aqua coat or Bondo glazing putty. It really comes down to customer's expectations of the lighting, where this thing's gonna be sitting, what it's gonna show. Now the lighting just coming down on these doors doesn't show a whole lot. I can look at it in different lighting and see what's going on. It looks pretty dang good, but I, always use an inspection table on my final coat um, and in between coats actually you know so i'm going to show you what this looks like we're going to do final sand final inspection spray these things and this thing is going to be done all right so here's my inspection table now i can set these doors on here and it's going to cast this light across here and i can see just some slight spots of grain but um, that is acceptable to me i don't see any imperfections where i see any nicks or dings 
but it's looking pretty good. Now, if I wanted to aqua coat one last coat, I would aqua coat one last coat at this point in time with something that has a very sharp edge. If I wanted to just get an absolute glass finish without any type of grain profile at all. So if I do any sanding on these cabinet doors on my final sand, I'm gonna be using Film Tech. It's a 320 plastic film right here and it sands extremely flat. I wanna do that because I want to get a really good flat sand on these, these uh, flat surfaces right here. I'm gonna expect front and back. Back sides of these doors, you don't see them. They're mounted onto the drawer, but they're looking pretty good. These are all looking good. This is now the time I would actually do any final sanding. And you wanna not over sand, so you burn into the wood, but just sand lightly. Just a simple little tip, I switched out my sandpaper. I started getting some loading on my um, film tech right here and it was causing swirls. And so I just switched it out to a new piece that didn't have any loading and it got rid of the swirls. If I need to do any sanding on any of the profiles or contours, I'm using a very fine half inch sponge right here that'll conform to my contours. I think these things are ready to go to spray my final coats. So just gonna be, I got my cup hooks on, hangers all ready to go. Just gonna hang up, spray both sides, all four edges, and we'll be done. All right, there you have it. Our cabinet makeover is all complete now. Using Aqua Coat, getting rid of oak grain. I gotta say, this thing looks like glass. We sprayed it with Benjamin Moore Advance. Uh, I sprayed, brushed, and rolled, tested it out. The Benjamin Moore Advance sprayed this thing out. Absolutely amazing. I sp uh, sprayed hanging using a PSDR. Sprayed um, laying down also, and I think it sprays out a lot better when you can actually lay it down. We did uh, use our spray booth here to spray this thing from paint line but the project is complete now and you can just see this thing is like glass there's almost virtually no oat grain left on this thing so this thing went from a $25 cabinet in a rehab store to a cabinet that's now going into this uh, brand new bathroom it's gonna look absolutely amazing simple little cabinet makeover well, I guess I wouldn't call it simple but you know it was some work but it turned out absolutely amazing using aqua coat and advance so there you have it it was i don't know a long four hours but hopefully you got something out of this entire video compilation on estimating and painting kitchen cabinets if you haven't got something out of this and you need to know just leave it down in the questions and comments section below we'll try to get to those and answer your comments if there's something we need to video and help you out let us know down in the comments section below once again Again, and if you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving us a thumbs up. It's just a simple way to help encourage us to continue to make these videos. And like we always say, we will see you next time on our next video. Ow.